one of us had a faction who ruled for 65 million years, and the other had a faction who napped for 65 million years. Nepo babies. That, got, that God got, literally got, gave you psychic them. powers. I don't want to hear it, Mr. Primark Man. <laughs> <laughs> who gave them power? Who has the real nepotism? No, they stole it. It's different. Emperor stole the power. Oh, so you're right. a faction. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Beginner to Expert podcast on law crimes. Today, we are going back into some filthy Xeno law with the Necron dynasties. Ooh, very spooky Ooh. skeleton boys. Green, lots of green. Uh, probably a fan favorite for a lot of guys. I know Eli has a particular passion mm. for this faction. Um, but uh, before we move on to talking about uh, the Necron dynasties and all their uh, former glory and skelly boys uh it is time for the question of the week so i will pass it on to colin ah i would uh be happy to go over the uh the questions of the week i picked out uh so we had the uh hashtag lost primark uh who was who was the uh the lost primark from last week and uh i got a i got a couple uh, bangers. I'm already Three. feeling silly. This is not four, good. <laughs> four of them are bangers. One of them I picked solely because it fuels my degeneracy. So, uh, four out of five, I think I hit the mark. You all hit the mark. Uh, one out of five, you hit the mark for me, and the other three are going to hate me for it. But that's okay. <laughs> uh, we'll start off with number one by Scowleasy. Uh, the hashtag lost primark was Ferris <laughs> <laughs> Menace. Because there ain't no way some bum named Iron Hands who had Iron Hands, <laughs> no. the leader of the Iron Hands whose ship is the Fist of Iron, is actually oh. canon. No, oh, my boy. <laughs> oh, oh look at how they massacre my boy like that. Oh. <laughs> Shout out to Ferris Iron Hands, the Iron Hands man. Oh. <laughs> His Iron Hands are pretty cool if he has me. <laughs> They're pretty cool. His name is. <laughs> oh, this hurts my soul. Imagining him now on the on the uh, the fist of iron with his iron hands, called Iron Hands Man, eating his cereal, which are little iron hands. Um, <laughs> Kellogg's brand Iron Hand. Well, whilst listening to his favorite band, I like Iron Hands by the Iron Hands. Oh. <laughs> I am Iron Hands. <laughs> I am Iron Hands. Da, 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 this da, wounds da, me. Da. Wounds my soul. <laughs> yeah, the next one, and uh, we'll just get the, the 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 degenerate one out of the way now, so you can all rest easy. So uh, hashtag lost primark. His name was Pancreas, and he got erased from history because he found an STC that could create VTubers, and he tried to replace his Space Marine Legion with a VTuber <laughs> army. Oh, very nice. I can see very it. Nice. Yeah, it's a little too. Uh, I, there, I would, it? in fact, the uh, the Hatsune Miku Marines would reign supreme. <laughs> I don't even know who that is. I'm assuming it's good. I mean, when you said controversial, <laughs> yeah, oh, it's great. You said controversial at the beginning. I thought, oh god, he's not gonna say Epstein or something like that. <laughs> but that, that, that Jesus that's Christ! Cool. No, I said <laughs> the general of law crimes. Everyone, you got like, <laughs> and it's a kind of and like how scum. Talking about God, there's me and Eli in the, in the middle, just kind of looking awkwardly, going, "What is he on about?" <laughs> I like people who pretend to be anime people. I'm not going to the fucking <laughs> Epstein Island. We need an adult. <laughs> moving on. <laughs> we moving on from that one. Now you need to think about what you've done. I did. <laughs> moving actually. on from that one is a. Uh, oh, that was by Joe Pippin. Pardon me. I bet I know who you're a fan of. Uh, moving on. Uncle Sam one six three seven. Hashtag lost Primark. The eleventh Primark's name is Craig. He was first for attending the Denny's Grand Slam and not inviting the Emperor. Bro, bro, I love the Denny's Grand Slam. Bro, the Denny's Grand Slam is amazing. <laughs> oh, uh, I have a quick story that related to oh. Denny's. Good. Uh, it was when I was in like freshman year of college. It was a, uh, it was a bunch of a uh, like a, uh, a lot of my Muslim friends when they were breaking fast at like very early in the morning, like before sunrise. We'd all go, uh, they would all go to Denny's. Uh, and a bunch of like all the rest of us would just go with because we're like, yeah, let's hang out. It's three in the morning. We're in 
freshman year of college. We have nothing time better to, go to do. Exa and it, yeah, that's the only time you can respectably eat at Denny's. <laughs> uh, so you'd see 20 people lined up outside of Denny's, half of which were Muslim and half of which were high white trash white kids. <laughs> oh, gosh. I've just Googled Denny's, though, like pancakes with eggs and bacon. That's, that's right, baby. What do you mean that's what? strange? They're all what? breakfast strange. foods. What? They're what? breakfast. We don't I've really have pancakes, pancakes with, with bacon. Yeah, like hash browns. Yeah, fruit. What, hash browns? Hash browns? with fruit because we're not trying to ruin our yeah, veins. Yeah, we, we and eat <laughs> we eat fruit <laughs> too. We just have fruit yeah. as a side well, along with the know. side of. You bacon. have syrup. You don't pancakes. have fruit. You have syrup. Yeah, okay, that's we I get sucked of fruit every time I have breakfast now. You put you can put fruit on the pancake. Yes, that's the point. This isn't a. Just you can use fruit and, and syrup, but no bacon. Oh, but why would bacon ever be near syrup. that? Yeah, why would you put bacon? That because it's a know. breakfast it's food. Breakfast food, yeah. Yeah, God. it's more like a dessert, isn't it? It's like you what bacon is a dessert? It's like a sweet thing to have oh, with your. Oh yeah, now I'm switching sides. <laughs> What's going on? It's, it's a sweet thing to have with your breakfast. God, like bacon, it's just a carb to have with your breakfast. Bacon and pancakes. I've never heard of that combo. Like yeah. what? Seriously. Somebody pull up. Somebody pull up the clip of Jake the dog singing making pancakes, <laughs> making bacon pancakes. I mean, bacon pancakes. pancakes. That's what I'm gonna Listen, make. Listen, a full a full English breakfast has a lot of these things, but not pancakes in it. Okay, not pancakes. It's not crazy, yeah, but it's just yeah, I wouldn't, you, you, you wouldn't have something sweet dinner song, food. <laughs> but, but in that song, it's in a fantasy universe, therefore it gets a pass. That's why. Yeah. Okay, moving on before we uh, take <laughs> well, the debate takes too much time. Welcome to the Necrons, everyone. Necron uh, yeah. Necron Two more this quick questions. I know. Over. <laughs> I know I know five is a bit much, but the rest will go quicker, assuming we don't get <laughs> sidetracked with bacon <laughs> again. Uh mm. Zach M5485 says hashtag lost Primark. His name was Sigmar, and he was kicked out because Ems was jealous that he was doing a better job at dealing with chaos. Nice. And he uh, owns a Warhammer. And he does actually have a Warhammer. That's uh, kind of an indisputable leg up he's got. I've, I've got to admit, I do like the beard as well. But beard is also quite good. Iggy should have a beard. Although the I only thing... I, what's up, Eli? I miss the days where Warhammer Fantasy wasn't confirmed to be a different universe from 40k. Yeah. People got angry, though. Yeah. I will say, though, that uh, the only issue I take is that Sigmar is... Uh, is being depicted as a mere Primarch in this case, which is simply false. True, True that is heresy. Uh, and for the last one, uh, Jack Smith 1666, hashtag lost Primarch, <laughs> Eldrad Uthron. <laughs> On day 542, Whoa. the other Primarchs realized he was Whoa. not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I just like the mental image that gives. Oh, it's you funny, dude. <laughs> yeah, you got these like 20 or 19. Other gigantic, <laughs> massive brick shit houses of men. Then an elf is just standing there, like, yeah. just like, 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 like carrying him on his shoulders because he's so small in comparison. <laughs> like, like, small over. brother. The father has, has need of us. Your <laughs> legs are not thick enough. You are not structurally sound. Are you getting enough, enough protein, elves. brother? Yeah. <laughs> I just, Jeez. I just like the mental image of that one. Oh, <laughs> just saying out. I'll drive with his brittle bones now as well. He's just not hacking it. Yeah. <laughs> He's just having a family photograph Ooh. and you can only see like the top half of his head and the bottom of the frame while all of them are standing up. <laughs> <laughs> and he has it framed in his room and he feels crap when yeah, he looks yeah. at the frame photo. Like, like, oh, oh my god. Good oh. times, good times. Then I stabbed Vulcan. Oh, <laughs> he didn't need to do it though. It was, it was a help yeah. stab. Hey, he He's tried his the best tallest Primark as well. <laughs> Speaking of uh, uh, help, though, we do need uh, you beautiful listeners' help for our next question of the week. Uh, Colin, would you mind telling us what the next question of the week is to get the uh, get some spicy uh, comments going on that one? Of course. Uh, you rule. The next question of the week is: uh, You rule your own dynasty. What is their name, and what do they specialize in? Hashtag Dinosi. We're bringing it back. <laughs> We're talking about the Necrons. Yeah, right. That was the first word uttered on this channel was me being oh, yeah. the worst. We're bringing it back, baby. Yeah, it is the eternal meme of law crimes. <laughs> uh, and it's all Colin's fault. So there you go. A good example <laughs> would um, be uh, Rem and Stein, which are essentially the entire dynasty we would be based off of Remy from Ratatouille. And <laughs> 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 because he is a... He is the dictator that we all know that he truly is. And essentially they would just throw food and cutlery at other races and try and eat them. Much like a Grom the Ponch feel, if anyone knows their mm, fantasy lore too. 
I don't know why, but my mind went to Ren and Stimpy at first, and honestly, <laughs> I think that I think that would be much more horrifying than anything 40k has. What's yeah. the rat from um, Ratatouille? He was like the slightly bigger one. <laughs> He's like a bit more muscled. I know, I've, he wears I've, never, I've never seen Ratatouille, so I don't know. You haven't seen uh, anything? Oh my god. See it's Star Wars. <laughs> Okay. Hey, there were a few that comments means... saying they were surprised that you were like berating me for liking Return of the Jedi more than Empire. And they're like, Colin has seen a film. Hooray! All right. <laughs> to both, uh, that doesn't really mean anything. I've seen Star Wars. That means I've been alive in the past 50 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that should be school curriculum at this point. <laughs> I, I honestly. Star Wars. You could probably get away with it in a history class for a cultural analysis or something. True. Would have been something well, I would do in finals week when I'm done teaching if I stuck with it. But well, I, I know some of you, I know some of you Necron homebrewers out there, so I'm expecting a three-page novel in my comments. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the, the, the they're robots. Groove on Instagram, he's got some some cool stuff. They're robots. I'm involved. I expect mm. a whole lot of garbage, viewers. <laughs> don't just, don't disappoint me. Necrons don't need a pancreas, so stay away from it, people. Yeah, stay There's away from the diabetes, happen. though. You have much better outlets of trash related to me you can go through. <laughs> Speaking of that, oh, though, man. we begin today's episode, though, on the Necrons, and I'll be taking it away. Is everyone ready? I yeah. am. I'm excited. Yes, I'm not going to lie. I thought you were going to like say a sponsor there for a second. Like, <laughs> <laughs> My entire life is uh, sponsored, essentially. I'm not even yeah. a real person. Um, but speaking of people who are not real people anymore, um, the Necrons, boys, our story is a macro. Uh, it's a macro. Um, <laughs> it's, actually, oh, ooh, it's, ooh. A, it's not micro oh, anymore. Oof. They are gone. Um, but for some people who may not get the context of that joke, uh, we'll be diving into the Necrons lore. And their story begins uh, a little bit far back, so not just... Obviously, it's called Warhammer 40k. Uh, we are not going back 40,000 years. We are going back 60 million years before the modern timeline. This is the very birthplace of Warhammer lore itself. And this begins with the Necron Tier. And they live on a kind of crappy homeworld. It contains... It, it does have some interest to it. They're like vast denner. The vast deserts, not deserts. Desert. Vast, not vast, vast Denny's. Den <laughs> the only that's how bad it was. The only restaurant was Denny's. The pancakes have scarred me. Uh, so, um, but they live in like a desert world, and you'll probably guess there's a lot of like ancient Egypt. Um, if you're a uh, you Warhammer fantasy fan, where you come from Total War, they're obviously a little bit similar to the Tomb Kings. Sorry, a little bit very similar to the Tomb Kings. A little bit rewritten to be the Tomb Kings. In little, space. little bit. Um, but their home world is a sort of vast desert place, very much ancient Egypt, lots of old creatures, scorpions, all those kind of things. And the Necron to themselves are a humanoid race. I think if you see a Necron or a, um, what was back in this time, a Necron tier, one of flesh, they just kind of look like elongated people. Their skin is sometimes gray and they do retain a lot of the similar features of an actual Necron. It is very uh, close. And the Necron tier from their earliest days, uh, they have it bad because they live under a super irradiated sun that basically ruins their life. So the Necron tier, they do sort of develop and grow. Obviously, this is 60 million years before even humanity was primordial soup. And they suffer from regular um, like sort of disgusting growth of cancers all over their bodies. It was a bad time. And... Their entire culture was essentially fragile and dying of old age was not heard of, really. And the Necron tier, obviously dying young, they would learn to venerate death. Death was pretty much everywhere around them. Their gods that they created were aspects of death. They had great mausoleums. There was a extremely... Uh, strict hierarchical structure for the Necron tier. <laughs> <laughs> for some reason, I've just had that image of Danny DeVito in uh, Always Sunny going, suicide is pretty badass! <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely not the um, image of, you know, emerging into death like Danny DeVito emerging from the couch when <laughs> sweaty and <laughs> not wearing any clothes. <laughs> but the Necron tier, very much, death was, everything was around death. It was inevitable and it wouldn't be long and their life was pretty painful because again living under constant radiation sickness and the sun pretty bad time 
The Nekontir, though, would eventually make it to the stars. They'd eventually, like us, sort of develop technology, and they finally would cross paths with the Old Ones. And this was a psychically gifted race who were seemingly immortal. Uh, they're somewhat mysterious even to this day. The description of them are a bit hard to kind of gauge, but essentially they were way beyond what the Necrontir were. But the Necrontir were like, cool, you know, firm it. We, that's, that's cool, but they still wanted to do their own thing. So they built an empire over many millennia, built on different worlds. They spread out across the galaxy. But uh, this empire was fragile. Obviously, it was a warring case of different hierarchical and dynasties and different people clashing. And it was on the brink of civil war until their silent king decided to declare war on the old ones uh, for, quote unquote, the secrets of immortal life. As the Necrons were incredible, sorry, the Necron tier, excuse me, were incredibly jealous. Uh, unfortunately, the Necron tier got crunked. Uh, they did not, I know they didn't perform well. They had good technology, but the old ones just completely outmaneuvered them. And we're as, a, okay, sorry, they were like a race of emperors in terms of just psychic might. It's like you're not, yeah. you're not winning this one, guys. Sorry. It was just pain. It was. It was the call of the ambulance for not for me in the reverse, yeah. essentially. And the Necrontier were imprisoned upon their homeworld, again underneath the irradiated sun, but essentially all the Necrontier that were like spread out throughout the galaxy are now essentially cramped into one place. And as you can imagine, the Necrontier, they are somewhat similar to humans, and obviously very similar to humans, actually, that that's pointed out much about the law. They were very resentful of their exile and imprisonment. And during this time, they sort of found strange readings around their sun. So they designed uh, advanced technology to detect and then eventually converse with these ancient creatures known as the Kitan or Sitan. I'm not sure which one it's meant to be, but I'm going to go with Kitan. And the Necron would eventually build living metal Necrodermis bodies for this Catan. Just a slight uh, add-on. The Catan were uh, beings of energy, so that's why they weren't perceived in a normal way. And also, they didn't perceive the universe in a normal way, too. But the Catan once were like sort of simple, sun-devouring you know, energy creatures. They, not being fully sentient, it kind of shocked them when they were now put in a body, and they're sort of like, oh, I have eyes now. And the flavour of sun was like, it's like a good solid pasta, like you have maybe when you're, like, you're a student and you're cooking the pasta reliably, <laughs> but it's like, it's not enough. You know what I mean? Like after a while you get sick of it and they developed a new uh, flavor and a new taste, something which was the suffering and, and energy of life itself. And so they began to manipulate the Necron tier. They came in, they, they transformed their Necrodermis bodies into the guise of their death gods which I think was like you know incredibly manipulative, and they were there on the Necron to your home world, and they said we have a an idea, an offer. We can give you new bodies, ones better than your you know weak and you know cancer ridden ones, and we can declare war on the old ones together and basically get our vengeance because they also had a history with the old ones. The Necron tier, uh, you know, they had no choice really, and they agree. And they undergo something called the biotransference, which is a really big part of their law, and we will talk about that later in more detail. Essentially, this would transform the Necron tier race as they march through these like flaming uh, pyre factory incinerator machines, and they emerged as the Necrons. They were cast in Necrodermis bodies. They were stronger, but their life essence had essentially been devoured. And I think of it in a way where the information of the Necron tier was sort of downloaded into like metal bodies. And so only some of them retained their personalities. And then all of the now Necrons, so the entire Necron tier have died. And now the Necrons, they find themselves under the command protocols of the Silent King, who in turn is now forced, essentially he has no choice now, to follow the super powered up Kitan. And this is where the war in heaven begins. With the, you know, <laughs> everyone essentially wanted vengeance on the old ones now. And the War in Heaven, we have talked about the War in Heaven a little bit. That's one of our first episodes ever. It's a massive conflict. There's much ebb and flow throughout the... It's, we don't even know if it's millennial or possibly millions of years long. But it ended up with 
the Necrons fighting the Old Ones, and then even various races created by the Old Ones, such as Colin's favorite, the Eldari, or Eldar. They sort of found Ooh. their uh, <laughs> birth during this time, and obviously they'll be around for quite a lot longer. And this all sort of builds up to where eventually the Silent King enacts a million-year-long revenge plan by creating, in quote, galaxy-breaking weapons to turn upon the Catan, when the Catan had basically almost won the war and they were essentially fighting with each other because they were like, they're greedy and evil things. And this shattered the Catan into shards. And the Necrons now are like, yeah, we've got revenge, but essentially they don't create new Necrons because there's only a finite amount. And they realized with the rise of the Eldar coming, it was impossible to beat them. They knew the Eldar would rule the galaxy for a very long time. And so they entered into their long stasis sleep, which they which they had been missing for for much of the uh, human timeline. And they wanted to let the galaxy heal too. And obviously, hopefully, let the age of the Eldar pass into ruin. After, I will, obviously, we have talked about this before. I will admit, after 60 million years of rule by the Eldar, so Andy, I'm not sure you can... All right, um, all right good, good, good. Well, yeah, yeah, I'm so not sure I, you can... Why do you mention that? Yeah, so at most 10,000 years under humanity. Um, but this would, the Necrons are not out, you know what I mean? They've, they've gone down, but they've got back up now because after 60 million years in the 41st millennium, the tombs underneath thousands of worlds have begun to stir and finally the Necrons have begun to awaken. Is there any other sort of, uh, questions or any sort of thoughts anyone wants to share at that point? <laughs> um, the only thing is when you said about how the Catan consider suffering to be like a, a lovely pasta for some reason that combined with like when the necrons first go into those big furnaces and they come come out just like zahalash going hmm just like mama used to make like just something about the guitar being like yeah this was amazing Mwah, like, like, a doll, the, like a doll like a dolmio advert dolmio <laughs> necron sauce yum yum essentially that the, inter uh. the entire race is a pasta sauce now they've consumed it, <laughs> which is very dark uh saying it but obviously this is the grim dark future uh i hope Colin's got some thoughts on the Eldar coming up there. <laughs> you know, I would, uh, I would think, I think I'll just set a nice groundwork now. You know, if any faction aside from the Eldar had to win, I'm okay with it being the Necrons. Woo! It was Whoa. as long as it's one of one of the armies whose traces back to the War in Heaven. I think I'd be happy. You know, I'd be content at least. Total victory today. I've already won. All right, let's <laughs> settle down, buddy. <laughs> oh, babies of the 40k universe. One, <laughs> one of us had a faction who ruled for 65 million years, and the other had a faction who napped for 65 babies. million years. Nepo babies. Da got, da God got, literally got, gave me psychic powers. I don't want to hear it, Mr. Primark Man. <laughs> <laughs> who gave them power? Who has the real nepotism? No, they stole it. It's different. Emperor stole the power. Oh, so Emperor you're a faction of thieves who can't do anything by yeah, themselves is what I'm hearing. Being a Nepo, baby. Nah. <laughs> I Ish. call that inheritance. Well, uh, speaking of <laughs> more... Well, staying on top with the Necrons particularly, though, because they, they are... Uh, they, they are one... I think probably one of the more better ranges. So if you are listening or you're new, if you were, like, about collecting um, Warhammer stuff, Necrons probably one of the most beginner-friendly... Uh, races to collect and then they're also their design is pretty uh, badass as well like the death mass you know the basically the skulls and all that stuff and again if you've like seen things like terminator it's essentially there's a there's a heavy incline on terminator uh vibes in this one but uh speaking of <laughs> <laughs> speaking of more the, the, now, okay, now you've made me think necrons going into their big sleep and just going i'll be back it's like yeah they were they, they literally said that that is <laughs> <laughs> The Silent King probably whispered it though, like "I'll be back," you know, just like <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so to one guy, he's like, "Well, so I have to like say that to someone else?" Like, and then it like spreads on, and then everyone, by the end of it, everyone's like misinterpreted. It's funny. Um, but speaking of more juicy, uh, detailed Necron lore, though, I'll pass over to Eli as we turn into the uh, expert section. Take it away, Eli. Mm. Cue Egyptian music, fade from black. Sarah Connor steps out onto the Egyptian sands. <laughs> The pyramids dun, dun, in the background. Dun, dun. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, yes, we will be taken back 65 million years ago to the days of old and the days of flesh for the Necron tier people who, as Hal said, lived in complete and utter misery for a very long time, many generations past, as they lived for 
it would appear about 20 to 30 years. It never seems to be explicitly stated how long it was, but this lifespan will change, and it is it does get a little hard to understand, but you have to look at it from their eyes, not our eyes, in the concept of shortness. But yes, their homeworld was plagued by a radiation star, and this would evolve into them thinking that stars were kind of like malevolent beings that had demons, then like the stars would eat the people and send demons down, so they would later end up sacrificing people to the stars in what was called a Red Harvest in which um, these outcasts from societies would round up a bunch of people and they would just like bring them to the furnace and they'd all be sacrificed to the star every once in a while so that maybe they can get like an extra year or two of life or something and the star won't be particularly mean this year. And they would do that even after they would take to the stars and inhabit new planets. But yes, they're very Egyptian-inspired. As we said before, they worshipped kind of gods of death who would sort of go more into myth and legends and it would more evolve into like ancestor worship and pharaoh or pharaon worship and royalty worship in the end. The stones and stuff were ancient and sacred because they were the only things that lasted while the people died in these mausoleums and they basically lived in tombs and they were just passengers passing through the life onto the next of oblivion and whatever the afterworld was thought to be. Um, they use cubits to measure. That's a little, that, that's cool. I think that's fun. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but even as they progress in technology, the commoners still lived in mud shacks um, as they did not have the same level of sentience as a noble whose royal heka was grand and pristine. And they were essentially gods compared to the peasants. The peasants and lower classes and even like soldiers and stuff were seen as tools. And uh, according to sacred texts, they were literally less than the nobles. The nobles, like I said, had a higher state of being. Their consciousness was completely different. It was almost as if the nobles were a completely different species from the peasantry and the lower beings. But as we said, they took to the stars and they're living metal ships. The ships were slower than light speed, so they were very, very slow to get to other galaxies. But thankfully, this necrodermis living metal that they discovered, I don't remember how, I think it was just native to their planet, uh, made it so that these ships could self-repair on the way because necrodermis is basically an organic metal uh, that is alive and it can just rapidly repair and kind of flow like liquid and fix itself as it goes. So the tomb ships were able to repair themselves as they went through the long, long sleep in their tomb ships as they entered stasis and would eventually touch down on new planets. Unfortunately, these new planets would not be much better for quite a while because within their DNA uh, was inlated these cancers and radiation poisonings and it kind of just stuck with them forever. It was maybe like they evolved to only live to a certain amount of time and that just kind of never changed for quite a while so even on these planets their lifespans maybe changed from 20 to 30 to like 40 years so it was a little bit better it was like half of an average human lifespan probably uh but you know it still wasn't great and in this time they met with the old ones who deserved everything they got Ooh. which we'll talk about soon uh Ooh. the old ones talked to the triarch i don't know if the silent king was actually around yet or not i think he was but the, it's hard to say. It's, they more have the Silent King is like a position. So other over many yeah, different yeah. times in uh, Necron and Necron tier history, other people have inherited the Silent King mantle, mm. and like different dynasties have had it too. Yeah, and the the Triarch, I should say, is the ruling governing body of the Necron tier. It's three dudes, and the Silent King was known as Silent because he only would communicate through the Triarch, and he would never really talk face to face to anyone. But they met with the old ones. They saw these like alien species who were living in constant paradise, basically, who had immort immortality and vulnerability from the majority of the things in the galaxy. And they said, "Please, sir, just a smidgen of life." And the old ones <laughs> said, "No." A bit. And uh, perhaps the old ones thought that the Necrons were meant to live like this, so they didn't want to tamper with life. And I mean, it's it is kind of sound logic, but. Should have looked in the to the future, buddy. 
It's almost like hypocritical <laughs> in a way because they said that we didn't want to meddle, but then their whole thing was we, we like life. Yeah, yeah, they want to seed life. They're on the meddliest the people in the universe. <laughs> yeah, the old ones were cringe confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> they made Eldar confirmed cringe. Uh, uh, settle down, uh, buddy. They also made the Emperor <laughs> an old lore. <laughs> yeah. To be honest, though, the the current like setup with the Necrons, it just sounds like they have like the worst RNG starting point in endless space too. They like, really they just do. Really, <laughs> just <laughs> nothing around, and it's everything's fun, terrible. Nice. And the other societies are bullying them, like, oh, poor guys. Yeah, they they spawn no titanium <laughs> or adamantium. Oh, words out of my <laughs> mouth. <Hyperium. sighs> Where my unfallen bros at? Do that and the question of the week in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> I need my unfallen please, brethren here. We start an endless space war in the comments. Uh, so, uh, by the way, the uh, there is a Necron endless space faction. Basically, they're pretty cool. Mm. What are they called? Uh, I don't remember. I guess it the doesn't matter. <laughs> is that uh, the the, the, the Nihil. The, uh, it kind of sounds Nihilak. like Nihilak. Nihilak um, Dynasty. Maybe it's it a sounds reference. like that, but it's a, not no, the it's unfallen, a, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, they're a DLC race who are Egyptian spacefarers. We start the game with both the technology trees because um, they're so far ahead of everyone else from their ancient technology. I wonder I wonder what that was based off of. Although, hmm. to be fair, the Necrons are probably based off of something else because it's GW, so it's like there's the no Term original Terminator? Yeah, yeah. I didn't... I mentioned Hekka before, and I will talk about what Hekka is. Uh, it didn't seem to really be a thing that I ever saw until I read the Twice Dead King books, but... Twice Dead King kind of gives you a perspective of today's day and age of the culture of the Necrons, and it would appear that they had Hekka back then as well. But Hekka, Hekka is basically well-made manifest. If the Lord or Noble believes it is so, then it is so, and it is reality. Their words have the power to create reality. A statement filled with Hekka is a statement that cannot be denied by the galaxy itself, and if reality does not appear to match it, then it is up to the servants to do everything in their power to make it so. For if the noble says it, it is indeed truth. I think it's a pretty cool concept. And the Necrons still seem to believe it today, for the most part. So, if the king says something, then it is real, no matter what. And to deny so would be to deny their royal Hekka, which would be deny their uh, royalty and their nobility, which would be to deny the universe itself. The they do Necrons. as they say, or you're going to have a hecka for a bad time. Yeah, Wouldn't that's right, buddy. Well, yeah, it, does, right. it does cause some problems in certain books, this un unquestioning <laughs> authority. You'll mm -hmm. see it. Yes, the Necrons are very structured, but, I mean, nowadays they are plagued with political intrigue. But back in the day, they were also plagued with it, because now that the galaxy had been uh, populated by Necrons in general, the Necron tier had spread to... A lot of the corners of the galaxy, they actually created quite the place for themselves, and perhaps, I looked at, according to the internet, they had maybe, at this point, could be living up to like 200 years or more. Uh, the commoners probably kept to like 40 years or whatever. There were In some the, treatments they could, they had made some, yeah. like only the extreme, like high nobles could afford the yeah. treatments of like life yeah. uh, extension. What were the, basically, cryptex of the time... And like alchemancers and stuff would tend to the nobles and do their best to keep them healthy and whatnot. And uh, the rights of a, as I don't know what it's called, I feel, it sounded like rights of asphy asphyxiation, something like that. Oh, no, um, I, don't think, I hope it's not that. It, it sounds like that. It's a word that sounds like that. But they would wake up every day, the Necron, they would check their entire body for blemishes or bumps that would inevitably appear someday. And now 200 years might seem like a long time for us because it's literally double our average lifespan. Um, but the, all they had to compare themselves were the aliens of the galaxy, specifically the old ones, and eventually things like the Eldar, and even, I mean, I guess eventually Quarks. Both races that theoretically live forever. I don't know if an Orcs ever died of old age. I guess they'd die in battle before that Probably happens. Probably not. <laughs> but, yeah, it, it's, yeah, but they had basically immortal beings to compare themselves to, so it was like us comparing ourselves to a tree. Or we live 70 to 100 years, but a tree is going to outlive us 10 times that. And uh, all of a sudden, our lives are very short. And even nowadays, we accept that our lives are very short. And life is not long. Life is quite short in the grand scheme of things. So it's still fairly understandable that when the only other thing you know is immortality, 200 years seems pretty whack. Uh, even, if it's a, even if you've come a long ways in that perspective 
makes so you, makes I, you very bitter, wouldn't it? Yeah, they were very bitter. <laughs> Uh, not quite yet, though. They, they I mean, they hated them, but they were more busy hating each other. For the first wars of secession, the first civil war around the galaxy happened now because they were so widespread, the Triarch's rule was not very condensed in one spot anymore, and there was too much authority given to Pharaons who were ruling over their systems, and then overlords under them ruling, like, clusters of planets, lords under them, etc., etc. So everyone was fighting each other. It was a disaster. So the Triarch comes together... And they try to have an idea and say, we're going to band together to fight the old ones and gain immortality. And as it was said, uh, they were slapped back into reality and that didn't happen very well. They were brought to the corner of the galaxy with just a meager few planets, if even maybe a few a few star systems, I guess, would be a better thing to say. And they lost horribly, mainly because of the old one's psychic powers. But the Necrons here never had a connection to the warp even before they were Necrons. And the use of the webway was really OP because when you're when the enemy army can maneuver anywhere in like the blink of an eye and you have spaceships, it's just it's not a fair fight at all. And there was nothing they could do. They got wrecked very hard. But they certainly tried their best. So after this, things suck so much. The second wars of succession break out as the remnants of the dynasties are fighting over each other to get what tiny scraps are left. It's a very bleak time for the Necrons. And in this time, the Silent King and the Triarch make contact with the Catan. There's multiple theories of how they find them, um, just like probes finding them, or the Catan kind of came to them and started eating the star that was there. It was not doesn't seem to be confirmed, but the Silent King makes contact with the Catan, and... But at this time, as we said, the Catan were kind of like just animalistic, gaseous forms uh, who had resulted or devolved to their base instinct of just like eating stars. They weren't really conscious. They were just animals, very like godlike animals, but still just animals. But when they were given living forms by the Necrons in the form of the Necrodermis bodies, they gained intelligence and sentience from that as they kind of started to understand the galaxy and feed on misery and despair itself because the Necrons were not happy at this time. So, Silent King talks to Mephret Ran, who is the deceiver, and he did not know that was his name at the time. At least I sure hope he didn't. <laughs> he wasn't um, wearing like a like a name badge that just said, like yeah. in a subtitle, The Deceiver, because that yeah. would have been a, get, a dead giveaway. <laughs> and like, it was said that... John, prof- John His name is John Professional yeah, Liar. <laughs> 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 it was uh so that the things the deceiver say it's like it's impossible to know if he even knows it's true but the deceiver talked to the silent king but the days of old where the Catan had battled the old ones and they lost that war and that's why they had been devolved kind of into their gaseous uh unintelligible states so they have a common enemy now and the Catan claims to have the power that if they work together using their technology and the Catan's power, they could achieve both immortality and defeat the old ones. Now, the Catan, at this point in time, were the fabric of reality. They were literally gods, uh, as you may see. Like, it's it's hard to tell, but they were maybe like almost mini chaos gods, or they were almost like as powerful as chaos gods. I, I feel like they are. Because if an old one is as powerful um, as the Emperor, a Catan is stronger than an old one, theoretically. I was going to say that I think they're kind of similar to like what, uh, just obviously right now, like this time, almost like demon Primarchs in a way, where they're like super, like super powered up creatures that are almost world changing. Obviously they do get a, they they get a bit of a power up, which we'll discuss in a second though. Mm -hmm. There there will be Emperor-like soon though, which is very scary considering how they hate everything even each other well i think i think at this point they were already oh, they like, like, I think at this point they were emperor like almost and then when they fed on all the souls and stuff they became even more than that maybe they seem to be like on a similar scale to the eldar gods from what i could tell and i mean who knows how strong the emperor is the emperor is a god come on now we know that but yeah. the katan we can quickly go through the katan there's like 10 of them, some of them have literally zero lore, and some of them have a tiny bit of lore. So I'll quickly go through this so that we're not here for an hour. But first is, as a Garad, the Nightbringer, whose death itself, being in his vicinity, will cause complete sorrow and despair 
People will lie down and just die. He drains life of itself from all around him. He's the Grim Reaper to all other races, except for the orcs, because the orcs do not fear death, so he doesn't have much of an effect on orcs. Then we have Metroid Rand, the Deceiver. He's a master of illusion and trickery, uh, creating many images of himself. You know, in the tabletop game, he lets you uh, rearrange your deployment zone, stuff like that. Uh, one of his powers is called Cosmic Madness, which is pretty cool. And we have Magladroth, the Void Dragon, who is, uh, he's the Omnissiah. Boilers. Um, or is he? It, <laughs> he, the, this, I don't, I'm not sure how the, like, lore in the last five years went, which I mean, like, eh, it's been five years, I know, but whatever. Um. As it seemed that the Void Dragon awoke from Mars, but it's just a Catan shard, it's not the actual Void Dragon. And it said that the Void Dragon might actually be a full Catan, but it's unsure. But shards of him seem to exist, and it woke up, and it's here now, and it's pretty cool. But yeah, he laid within Mars, and there's kind of like a secret society in Mars that guards these vaults. It's in the, one of the Horus Heresy books, and it's a really good book. Uh, I think that he stays in there during the Horus Heresy, I'm pretty sure he doesn't get let out or anything. Uh, is that Sons of the Selenar? No, it's, I think it's just Mechanicum. Oh, it's just Mechanicum thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's it's a cool book. That's one of my favorites, I think. But yeah, he has mastery over creation and destruction itself. I think his main goal was to destroy, like, Vol from the Eldar and destroy the uh, whatever's of Vol. Talisman's of Vol. Vol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blackstone Fortresses. Yep. Because the Blackstone Fortresses were theoretically one of the things made to destroy Necrons. But I'm not sure. I'm not a Blackstone Fortress expert. If, so you, uh, if you're new to Warhammer, though, they are in the Battlefleet Gothic cinematics and that kind of stuff. They're literally massive, essentially star, sh- like literally st- literal, like <laughs> gigantic cartoon- chandeliers, <laughs> <laughs> cartoon <laughs> star shaped pyramid uh, cool. ships. Without too much spoiling, uh, one of them does something quite big on with Katia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A little bit impactful, one could say. Hey. I cry every day, every morning. And less um. tragic, Henry Cavill knows what they are. Yeah. <laughs> to a halt to bring attention to it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they are cool, though. Nice. They are. So, next we have Neforan, the Spiral Flame, who's just some random. And then Nyadrazatha, <laughs> the Burning One, uh, also flame themed from the first guy, uh, but he wanted to spread his fire to the webway. That was his main, like, story. And he showed the Necrons the Dolem Gates, which are these stone gates, it would appear, that allow the Necrons to pa- travel through certain parts of the webway. It's not perfect, and it's still a bit slower, but the Necrons do have access to the webway still from this day. So he brought his flames into the webway, and that was a big part of the war in heaven and a big advantage for the Necrons. Then we have... Does he, does he say flame on whenever he uses his powers? Yeah, he, he do. He do. Okay. He definitely does. Cool. <laughs> does he make a stint as Captain America? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, then we have Zar Hulash, the uh, potentate. Sorry if I've said any of these words. It sounds like potato. Sorry if I've said any of these words. Wrong. Uh, <laughs> the potato katan. They should cook him um, up. I've got to catch him. <laughs> and... Uh, it's apparently a shard of Zarhulash, the potentate, was used to power one of the eight Necron warp beacons known as the Pharos. So one of the Pharos beacons. I don't know if you guys know anything about that, because I haven't read that book, but it's a thing. They did and, a that is what they did. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, Kalugra, who's the master of destruction. Uh, Landigore, it sounds more like Klandigore when they say it in the books, so I'm not sure how to pronounce it but I'm saying Landigore. It's two L's at the beginning. He's the Flayer. He was probably the most important afterwards to the Necron storyline because he was the only destroyed Catan shard as Catan could not be actually destroyed. Sorry, no, he wasn't a shard. He was the only destroyed Catan. Because Catan could not actually be destroyed because they were the fabric of reality itself and destroying this one kind of unleashed and broke parts of reality releasing the Flayer virus onto the Necrons, which we'll talk about in a bit. Then we have uh, 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 Sauran Noga, uh, that sounds about right, the Outsider, who was the Catan god, tricked by Kegarak to eat other Catan, and then he went insane. And it said it is said that shards of Sauran, whatever, uh, causes madness, and people just off themselves whenever they see him, because they go crazy. He's trapped nice. in a Dyson Sphere beneath the Galactic Plane. 
And What's the, the the god of like madness from Elder Scrolls? Is it Sheogorath? Sheogorath. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, and Jigalath, basically him in 40k. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Yeah. And the heroes too much. Mm. Oh yeah, we go. We're getting our oblivion lore in here, boys. <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard Bruce. of the high elves? I don't want to hear about them. That's for sure. Stop, criminal <laughs> skull. You violated the law. It's just the classic. Oh goodness! I, I don't want to hear any talk of elves in my sacred Necron. You bad, not coming up. <laughs> the elder will pay with your up. blood. The elder get a pass. It's all right. It's all right. They're not the Thalmor embassy uh, ambassadors Very walking true. to White Run, who I'm about to kill. Walking in. <laughs> But yeah, Saran Noga is trapped in a Dyson sphere beneath the galactic plane, and the Harlequins kind of like whisper about him and say that his time will come one day. And he's depicted in the Harlequins dance. Um, but I think, according to the internet, in the Harlequin dance, they replaced this one with the Nightbringer instead for some reason. Couldn't tell you why. And we have Ygrania, the World Shaper, uh, Lashudra, the Endless Swarm. Ogdriada, the Arisen, uh, and that's all of them. So it'd be real cool if GW could, you know, uh, put those in, put those in the lore and or give us some more shards. That'd be pretty cool. I'm sure that the whatever $150 Void Dragon kit sold pretty good, so you could sell more $150 Catan shards, and I'd buy one. You're crazy. We need more Primaris lieutenants. Uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> Right, I was as I'm I mean, you know, you got in on the joke themselves. It's just sad now. <laughs> I know. Feels bad, man. Whatever. So the deceiver, they we've all banded together now. I kind of got ahead of myself talking about all the Catan, but they've all banded together now in a friendly alliance, then surely nothing will go wrong talking to these star gods who like to eat souls. It's probably okay. So the Silent King offers amnesty to all dynasties who are fighting each other uh, to join the new cause and the new hope of immortality and defeating the old ones. So, uh, with the help of Illuminor Caesares, the Catan shards, or the Catan, sorry, create the biotransference furnaces, which I yes. think Hal wanted to talk about a little bit. This is my favorite part of the uh, Necron's lore, just because it's so utterly grimdark. So the biotransference was kind of sold to the Silent King at the time, who is uh, Cesarek, who we will talk about a bit later. Um, they kind of, again, like they're, they're dressed as like they're essentially Necron tier gods. So they're like my literal, it'd be like someone dressed up as Jesus being like, like, but again, like, you know, huge and just saying, you know, bro, can you go do this thing for me? I swear, bro, do it, do it. You know what I mean? He like, it, it was a little bit unnerving. And they come to them with the plan of giving them new bodies to replace their cancer, cancer ridden ones. And I think, like Eli said earlier, I can't remember what the name of the ritual is, but Necron Tear every day wake up and they pat their bodies for the um, cancerous growth. So literally every day they're afraid of it. Um, even if you're a noble. So, you know, they, they kind of caught on to their fear there. And so the Silent King agrees and the biotransference begins with the Necron Tear constructing these enormous, like gigantic factory incinerators. And the Silent King orders the entire Necron Tear race to walk into these great foundries. And I think, I'm gl so glad Eli mentioned them earlier about the... Uh, I can't remember their exact name, Eli. It's the ones that are in red. Would you, would you call them the um, uh, the sacrificial ones who would sacrifice the necron? Yeah, I was trying. Ones. I was also trying to remember the the name, and I also forgot. <laughs> yeah, those those one the outcasts who paint themselves in like red paint, um, who would often create sacrifices to the gods. They essentially were like a military police, and they kind of went into every you know. Any Necron that was willing and even the unwilling were being dragged out by these sort of uh, haunting Necron you know, basically covered in blood a little bit like. And these, uh, the entire race left, you know, even from the little poor people, you know, the mud huts of the downtrodden all the way to those in the enormous and grand uh, mausoleums, they were all taken, even special note ones, things like... 
Orican and Trez, uh, Trezin or Trezin, who we will talk about later. Some went willingly, some were dragged by uh, others. And the Necrontier race in their billions were essentially march. It, imagine like in a you're in a line of like literally billions of people marching towards a huge furnace. And again, like you look up to the skies and it's you're on this black rock and this awful desert world. And above, as the people are walking, some of them don't even make it towards the biotransference furnaces because the necron. Some of them just die on the way because it's just such a long journey. And then you know sometimes the cancers just get them. So like the people, some people are like you know for their families. Others are literally just dragging their elderly and those who are ill. And they look above and they see like the entire. Uh, like the the Catan essentially like ghosts floating above the furnaces and like moving around like sort of spectres of death so it's obviously very creepy and they obviously feel very small and they essentially walk into these massive biotransference uh, furnaces and they essentially emulate they feel the entire pain of that situation that it is they literally burn and their memories are stripped from them. They are literally taken. As I think I said earlier, I'm of the opinion that they are, their memories, like basically who they were is actually turned into data because it specifically says the Necron, sorry, the Catan don't devour their souls. It's, I think it says it, they don't touch the soul. So I think it's, they take their life energy, just like general, you know, vitality. <laughs> and um, cause, the, cause the subject without ruining the flavour. Try so, our new Catan <laughs> furnace. Essentially, yes. And they are, you know, they, they, they turn into data, essentially, and then they are uploaded into living metal uh, necrodermous bodies. But there's something a little bit wrong with these bodies. So some of the nobles emerge and they're like, I feel stronger than ever, even though I feel a little bit different. And then they look to their side and like the common people are essentially like just, they are only like small parts of it they're essentially like slaves they are not even fully sentient some of these things they are literally robots and the nobles particularly they find that they are embedded with a command protocol so they literally become like robotic creatures and they are enslaved so enslaved to the silent king with the command protocol and the thing about the command protocol is they cannot uh rebel against anything the silent king orders them to do and you might think well why didn't you know so the necron tier so the necron tier are dead they are all gone there will never be a new necron tier there will never even be a new necron at this point they have all been turned and you may think oh why didn't they just turn on the katan here if they were angry about you know hey this deal seems like a bit sideways because the katana basically just devoured an entire race and they are souped up and now they are like got true gods and the Sun King essentially can't act against the Catan because in a way they also hold him hostage, being like, You really you wanna you can't fight you wanna fight the old ones and the Catan? They're not gonna and um, I guess you probably say the old ones protect life. The Necrons aren't really alive anymore, so I guess they would have just wiped them anyway. So the Necrons are here and they are essentially all under the command of <laughs> the Sonic King and the Catan. I hand it back to Eli to talk about what exactly they did <laughs> with this new Necron army and the brewing war between them and the old ones. Mm, they did. They did lots of good stuff. But yeah, uh, the Silent King felt nothing but despair after he looked over his people and saw what had happened as he watched the Catan Shars flying over the biotransference furnaces and eating their souls. Many of the Necrons... The, like 99% of them who could still think completely regretted biotransference and realized the mistake they made the moment it happened. And it was a very sad moment. And even though the Silent King had control of everyone, he felt like a tyrant and not anything better than that because they had no free will to say no to him anymore, like he said. But yeah, as they all came up, they, be, they are all marked by the uh, Ankh of the Triarch which is the kind of chess piece that you see on a lot of them. It's in other places in some place. But they also are marked by the dynastic symbol, 
but that's only reserved for the highest nobles to bear the full symbol of the dynasties, whereas the lesser nobles, or yeah, lesser nobles and kind of lesser ranks, maybe Lich Guard, sometimes maybe Immortals, but probably not, they have parts of the dynastic symbol, whereas the warriors and usually Immortals are seen as chattel, and they are not worth even marking for the dynasties. They don't deserve that. But the vehicles are all marked because they are the property of the Lord, and they're very important. So... When the War of Heaven starts now as, you know, it's the perfect time. The Necrons have gained immortality. They have incredible technology to go along with it because they were already had really good technology. They just kind of needed that one extra uh, cosmic reality bending step from the Catan shards. So they marched into the webway and they fought the old ones. And we kind of already talked about the War in Heaven for like two hours on the channel. So you should probably go watch that video. Mm so that we don't talk about it for two hours here. But to sum it up, it was a unfathomable uh, universe-ending war that we couldn't, like, our greatest, wildest dreams could not even think up of what happened. Uh, it was said that planets were basically used as ammunition, star systems were destroyed by the day, millions died constantly, and it was insane. It was gods fighting other gods. So, it like, we literally could not comprehend what had happened. But in this war, the Necrons and Gatan fought against the Old Ones, the Krork, the Eldar, and a few other of the Old Ones races. It was so bloody and horrible that it created the uh, the warp issues that we have today when the Enslavers came out and messed with stuff. And It was just all around incredibly ex extreme and out of this world and unbelievable. But in the end, the Necrons appeared victorious and they defeated the Old Ones. Except for one, who is maybe the Emperor, but nobody knows. And as the war ends, the Catan, as they go to feast on the Old One's souls, and they kind of are in this relaxed and prideful, arrogant state, the Silent King sees his only chance to take and defeat these hated enemies, uh, pretend allies of the Necrons, and he takes it, and they destroy the Catan shards in more unfathomable, extremely crazy battles because it's more gods. The fabrics of reality are bending. Millions are dying. There's so much so much loss and everything's horrible. But they eventually break them. As, they, as I said before, they cannot really be killed because they're part of reality. They're broken into shards and trapped within these Tesseract labyrinths and Tesseract vaults, which are almost like... The great, we talked about them in the Great Knights episode the other day. They're yeah. like many like super big mazes or other parts of... Uh, the plane of reality basically where they trap these things and they kind of make the Catan into big batteries for the most part where they harvest all their energy and use them to power things like I don't know, Dyson <laughs> spheres and Tesseract vaults, the big cube thing in the tabletop yeah. that has not very many rules, unfortunately. Uh, uh, I, I do like that. Like, oh, you're this primor primordial force with the power of gods, blah, blah, blah. blah. Charge my iPhone. Yeah, yep. that's your role now. Want to play Pokemon <laughs> Go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Trazen has one, and he uses it as a battery for slimness. But he also uses it to trade secrets, and he feeds it a little bit more every day. Oh, I don't know where can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just imagine it like you know when you got like a fish tank, and you just put a little bit of food in the top, and just opening a little bit of the cube, yeah. and just drip, <laughs> some food for you. There you go. Yum yum mm -hmm. yum. Well, now the next time for the Necrons to go to sleep. And they have released the Flayer virus at this point. I'm not sure if they actually know about it quite yet. More than just like, oh, this bad thing happened because we killed this guy. But it's probably just this select few of people who really want to eat flesh for some reason. It'll probably be okay. Don't worry and, about it. It'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> they also can't so, eat flesh, by the way. We, we had to mention to yeah, do a new well, They yeah. just shove meat onto their like, yeah. face plate. It's I'll, disgusting. I'll, I'll talk about the Flayer virus in like five minutes. Maybe yeah. less. But, um, Good enough. <laughs> the Silent King uh, sees, as we said, the Eldar. It is the time of the Eldar, for they are the predominant race at the time, and their psychic ability is unmatched throughout the entire galaxy. We know how the story goes. The Eldar became gods, basically, and then bad things happened because of it. Goofy Eldar. But, let me see. We, I have... Yeah, that was all that happened. Yeah, that was all that happened. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, here's an Orkin quote. Because Colin says the Eldar won the war in heaven. But I think I think Oregon has a pretty good rebuttal. I'll put it in the, in the chat. 
Oh, that's pretty base. Like, I disagree with Colin. I'll make him read it out himself. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, feel... Was it you who made me read the Bretonian quote? But it was on a quiz. Yeah. <laughs> Second time you've done this crap. Love me, <laughs> Bretonian. Anyway, Orican's cool, and I'm going to add my own quote after this. So, mm. anyways. Uh, time is a weapon like no other. If nothing else, I can simply wait for my foes to rot. Uh, that is very true. Uh, consider, however, that the Eldar do not rot. They turn into crystal. And uh-huh. Orican himself also admitted both Necron and Eldar were perfect in their own yes, way. Yes, yes. I like the Necron. I like the Eldar. Sorry. Calm down. <laughs> uh, the Eldar are cool. But their society, the their society certainly did rot. And they are... It, it, did, it did do a bit of a bit of an uh-oh. A bit of an oopsie-daisy. Time was certainly on the Necron's side in this fact. And they just waited out the reign of the Eldar. And they did do that. Because, I guess we could talk a little bit about Orc and the Diviner. Because he was the one who told them, all right, we got to wait exactly 65 million years, and then we can wake up. Because Orkin was a master astromancer, and he could see the stars and see the futures. Let's talk about him a little bit more uh, in a bit. He originally told the Necrons to not go under go through with biotransference, but nobody listened to him, and he's bitter to it to this day. But Hal's going to talk about him in a little bit, so we'll get back to him. Yes. And now the Silent King leaves. He goes into exile after doing his last command, which was basically just go to sleep, and in 65 million years, wake up and return the dynasties to what they once were. Return the dynasties to their former glory. And heavily weighing on his mind at the moment was sorrow and wishing that he could return to the time of flesh. So this will also weigh heavily on many of the Necrons who awaken in the future. So now they're asleep for 65 million years. And things don't go perfect, because even for their incredible, um, unimaginable level of technology, 65 million years is a long time to be asleep. So it was a pretty risky maneuver. They all go underground into these tomb worlds, which are, as it sounds, they're just worlds that are tombs, and where millions of Necrons sleep below the surface, and many of them go unscathed, a lot of them go unscathed, but it's said that millions, if not billions of Necrons were lost in the Great Sleep, due to many reasons, like natural disasters or technological failings, because even though they have perfect technology, one little thing, one little tiny, tiny thing will build up onto another, and after 65 million years, it kind of cascades into one giant issue. So, lots of them were lost. A lot of them, another reason was due to a late talk Eldar. They particularly hate the Necrons, and they would go around raiding Tomb Worlds and destroying it. A lot of them made it through, though, largely due to the technology and also their canoptic guards. Wraiths, scarabs, other things. They're basically metal insect guard things that kind of stalk the tombs and protect the tombs while their masters are asleep. Scarabs are good at repairing things and whatnot. Can also talk about them a little bit later. But when the time of waking comes, there's a lot more issues because a lot of people wake up being just crazy in general. There's the flare virus, the destroy virus. Some people don't wake up at all. Some people wake up with no personality as their personality engrams have been fried or completely destroyed. Something has gone wrong. So they're plagued with issues. And now we can talk about the flare virus a little bit, which is, it was the gift of Clandagor, or Landagor, whatever. And due to them breaking his part of reality, he released this, Thing, this curse onto them, which is a mystery to their race this day. It's a mystery to the galaxy because it's, how do you infect a mechanical race with such a virus is very unsure. But it's basically Necrons who crave flesh and they want to be engulfed in flesh. They want to be flesh and blood again. So they flay their victims and drape themselves in their skin and they wear their faces. They crave having a face like no other would appear. And they crave to eat flesh. So they stuff flesh into their mouthpieces and into their guts and, and it all just seeps through and they, their hunger is never satiated because they have no stomachs to fill. So they're in constant misery, wanting flesh, and they're insane. They seem to be satiated at least to like a docile state so they can have moments of lucidity, but it's more of like... At one point, they can't control themselves and all they can think about is flesh and the next point, 
they can control themselves and all they can think about is flesh and killing other people uh, and there's so some it's, it's like the equivalent of like the butcher's nails for a night lord like i'm gonna do a load of flaying until i'm satisfied and until not i'm not gonna have the endorphins to stop my suffering but for a, yeah. for in a, a world eater form. if the night yeah. lords got uh butcher's nails i think i would that would make them even more terrifying oh my god yeah <laughs> who do you reckon's better at flaying a flayed one or a night lord oh who's got one well, gotta be the flayed one bro it's in Emperor's the name children. Yeah, it's Emperor's in the children name. surely yeah buddy maybe <laughs> Fabi style specifically but you know it's in the yeah, name like, like, flayed <laughs> just imagine them all getting together for a convention doing like this is how you sew the skin together without seeing mm-hmm. the seams oh, it would definitely happen in ohio for no reason use the iron <laughs> oh that's clever it gets rid of all the creases oh very good i imagine they'd argue over like you know like oh we showed up like the same thing you know the same human skin cape and that's one of us has to change <laughs> wearing the same clothes oh i know if, i do want to talk about a really like there's funny like even the necrons are like when you see flay ones they are terrifying like, even that their bodies kind of adapt to their need to flay flesh or they get like elongated claws but my favorite parts of it is like is in i don't know if you can talk about it eli and uh mm-hmm. the twice dead king parts but there is like a funny part where like one of them is like hiding behind some enemies and he just goes gets out like his really long dagger finger it looks like one of the main necron overlord and goes shh and it's like i'm gonna play you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? yeah. there's like yeah, some funny moments awesome. and like some of them when they catch the disease they're like it's like they got caught cheating on their diet essentially they're like yeah. it's like catching someone eating a snickers bar when they were yeah. saying they're like oh i'm losing weight like oh, oh i'm so sorry like oh it's so it's just so awkward oh my god like <laughs> it's really funny that yeah. the like it's... some aspects of the uh flare virus mm-hmm. it's it's tough and none of none of the necrons actually know how they catch it and it's seemingly no necron is safe even Immotech the swarm on himself could get it for all we know but it starts with a like simple, tiny cravings of flesh, and eventually evolves into what we said before: insanity. Their backs hunch over; their claws elongate. They usually carve out smiles and faces on their faces because they want to face so bad, but they just can't have it. And it seems one of the main causes, or ways that it's explained at least, is the diasporic, which is talked about in the Twice Dead King book, which is pretty cool. And it's basically kind of like the echo and the remnant of the Necron brain, and it's trapped forever in a state of bodiless aloneness. And it just wants to have a body again. It wants to have something to be with it. And it could start with them, the, the Necron trying to blink, but they have no eyelids. They're trying to ble- breathe, but they have no lungs. And it just... I have no eyes and I must blink. <laughs> yeah, literally, literally. I did love and, that uh, part, yeah. Like they have a, like some of them said so they feel that they suddenly go, like they, they're forgetting to breathe because that function mm-hmm. in their brain is like, like in our own brains, we have like the, it's not a conscious part necessarily of like, you know, pumping your heart and things like that, but they have that thing in their brain which is like, oh, I'm not breathing. And like, yeah. oh, I don't breathe. Yeah, I had a phantom breathe. I have yeah, a question yeah, though, just, yeah. with yeah, the flayed ones. Do they have like the equivalent, like what is their pre- preventative measure? Do they have clinics? Do they have like any way of oh, no, they, they they any methods? They, they don't know. They can, it seems if you have like a strong enough force of will, you can like stave it off for a long, long time. I think the, one of the characters in the book had been staving it off for centuries basically. And a cryptic in the book also claimed that there may be a way to get rid of it, but it seems that there's absolutely no cure. All you can do is try for as long as possible to hold it off until hold on. you give in. Yeah, but the diasporic, it seems to be like how you have a phantom limb if you lost a limb. It's like a phantom brain, and it's this big scary monster that will try to engulf the Necron if they even give into it for a second. And they have basically they have panic attacks as they're they all of a sudden realize that their bodies have been starved for millions of years and they can't breathe they can't blink they can't eat they can't drink they can't do anything and basically if you were had every organ in your body fail at once and you were suffering every possible like ailments at one time being hungry and thirsty and your skin is falling off and all this stuff at once is basically what they feel even though they have none of it so it's a very scary thing for a necron to experience and the other issue is the destroyer aspect which is pretty cool uh they don't know where it came from it's completely a complete mystery it might have been an issue with just their algorithms or even more sinister the Catan may have devised it 
and had it to be the end fate for all Necrons. But essentially, nihilism and murderousness takes over the Necron, and they start to mutilate their bodies, taking off arms and replacing them with cannons, taking off limbs, replacing them with uh, hover things or with big giant legs. Their bodies will often warp to become gigantic, and all they will care about is eradicating human life. In the Infinite and Divine book, he meets up with some destroyers. Oh, yeah. And it's, so good. it's very cool. They um, are just, like telling Trazen how they're going to destroy the world. And it's not just like they're going to go kill stuff. They they go and like just destroy the polar ice caps so that the world, uh, they will be able to more efficiently kill everyone as the like floods wipe out more people. So they'll have like 300 less years of having to kill people. And then they want to like get rid of something like trees or something so the atmosphere will burn up they all they care about is destroying all flesh they hate flesh and hate living beings with a passion even animals it's not just sentient life they'll kill animals and plants and trees and it, they don't care they, they were really cool you know. the flesh is weak even <laughs> they, for yeah. them <laughs> they even make a plan to kill the bacteria as well yeah. which is like that's how like mentally ill they are it's insane yeah. they're very crazy and they need to be generally controlled by a destroyer lord uh necrons hate them but they form def uh, destroyer cults off in the side i guess i talk about the flayed flayer virus but i didn't talk about flayed ones as much the probably the coolest part about the flayed ones is that they can travel through dimensions they have their own little like pocket dimension where they can just go and hang out and live so they can appear on a battlefield at any point anywhere so the society hates them but they don't really have a choice if they want them to show up or not because they'll just apparate and like claw out of reality to kill all these people and then hopefully leave. If they don't leave, some lords just get rid of them and kill them because they don't want them around anymore. It's kind of a shame um, that they're ashamed of them in a way. That, they're, they necron, they're necron yeah. lepers, essentially. Yeah, oh, basically. Oh, very, uh, very good link there. Yeah, yeah. They're scared mm -hmm. of catching the virus, although it's no, nobody knows how you catch the virus. It seems... Touching flesh is a possible way that starts it. So touching flesh is very taboo in Necron society nowadays. And the sacred machine is that. It is sacred. And all flesh is disgusting and should be eradicated. But not to that degree. That's more of a destroyer thing to think. It's kind of they a very complex way of thinking. It's hard to explain how the Necrons think. They're very fleshed out nowadays, ironically enough. Um, they have yeah. a lot of character and... Um, emotion in the characters nowadays but it's pretty cool um now that they're waking up they see every race other than the eldar basically as nothing but insects they're like to us or sorry to a necron we are we are literally insects it's like how you would see an ant they see us in the same way and in a sense it is almost the same way they have they are on a higher plane of existence almost from the rest of the galaxy minus the eldar which is a nice way of I don't know. They're, they're not very nice, but cool how they see it. I have another quote. This one for me? For moi? This is, uh, yeah, sure. Said by some Inquisitor random. I don't know. Oh, cool. That's, that's fitting for me then, I suppose. Okay. <laughs> we are less than cattle to these beings. Chattel to be cast aside. Consumed or made sport with for their pleasure. There is not one among them but would pay a head... There is not one. Shit. There is not one. Oh, I can't get this. <laughs> there, okay, is, it's okay, it's okay. there is not one amongst them that would pay heed to a world of man as I would to an ant on my boot. Nice. And Colin just put among us. Very good. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Joining the club of the club of flubs. That's a really <laughs> <neat> name. <laughs> it was he. He. I was like heed, heel, who. I let you flub the court every time. <laughs> Um, yeah, they they see us as insects, but touching flesh is very, very serious thing that they don't want to do. <laughs> in the, it just makes me think of touching grass, like touching flesh. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> out, touching flesh. <laughs> in the Twice Dead King book again, because that's like the main. I think that's the the best Necron book you can get right now. Um, the main character like squishes a grot beneath his foot, and his submines because they have like the Necron. It's so hard to say how incredibly insane the Necron technology is. The main character has sub-minds within himself. They're, like, his own consciousness put into different kind of personalities, and they're part of his brain. Um, so one of them, 
like is constantly reminding him about the taboo. So it freaks out when he touches this grot or when he like touches an orc war boss and it's like screaming at him and it's going crazy. And then the grot's blood gets on the sacred stones of the crypt and it gets even worse. And yeah, they have a lot of very peculiar, um, idiosyncrasies. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way of putting it. But submines is a cool thing that they got. Um, another part of their technology the main thing in their army, their army bonus, is the reanimation protocols. As they're made out of living metal, um, even doing catastrophic damage to an Ekron might not kill it. It will regenerate and stand back up. Its limbs will find each other, kind of, and, like, ooze back together in a liquid metal, like, conglomeration, and it will stand back up and keep fighting. So only the most incredible damage can put one of these things down, and even then, they will generally just phase out back under to the tomb world if they're on home turf or into the flagship if they're not on home turf so if you're okay. fighting against the necrons there's like a 99 percent chance that the necron you just killed you didn't actually kill and you're gonna fight him again tomorrow and they're all I their algorithms like that i yeah. don't because my yeah, boy like, high marshal hailbrecht stomping uh, that necron never gonna, and then he kept getting back up he's like Chad 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 the storm lord oh, he's so freaking cool. i'm gonna talk about him uh, in a little bit too he's so issue like, Shout out to really, uh, still issue. Still issue. He lost like five uh, times. Uh, like, oh no, he Uno didn't lose like, no. because he kept pulled, standing back up. It doesn't matter what tricks you have up your sleeve, he lost. That's right. Shout Rob out to um, I'll do a quick shout out to my good friend Matt, who has tortured me endlessly with reanimation protocols on the tabletop. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, love me resurrection orbs, love me D3 love plus me three next warriors. And I'd yeah. like to give a big shout out to the Dawn of War AI on hard difficulty. <laughs> pain. Very, very much pain. The uh, nobility's bodies are more strong, they're more resolute, is kind of forgot to say it. In biotransference, um the royals and the overlords were given the best materials to be made into, and kind of the scraps were given to the peasants. And the peasants who awaken the Necron warriors were never actually any soldiers of any kind. They were just like farmers and regular dudes. They had no combat experience, but now they live in the soulless machine. And it would appear that Necrons do not have souls. It's, I feel like it's hard to say that completely, but it seems pretty, pretty absolute that they do not have souls. And when they wake up, they kind of realize this. They feel like the cold itch in the back of their minds, their hollowness. They can just, they know that there's something missing and which is why many of them want to return to the times of flesh. There's a good link so, about um, when is I don't know if it's a spoiler already, but there's like a good part part where it's the character Fabius Bile, how him and Trazen have that conversation where uh, Trazen says like, "Are you, you know, is the real Fabius Bile, you know, technically dead, and you're mm. just like a you're like you're you're a copy of copy of his memories essentially." And I think the Necrons often feel like that. They might. The Necrons at well, the Necron tier are actually like dead. Like the the real characters of them are dead, and these are like the imprinted uh, remains, essentially, of what that thing yeah. was. And they're just well, kind of like it, living ghosts. Isn't there a bit in Infinite and the Divine where Trazin and Orokin are having a chat, and Orokin's all about? I can't remember exactly what it's about, but he's saying about how he wishes he could like taste or he could do. Things he used to, like that kind of Barbosa in the first uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. You know, I feel nothing, not the warmth on my skin or the taste. Is like, yeah, it's just, mm. and there's something where he like, he he's like, yeah. I wish I could do this again, but I can't because I don't have taste buds or touch or mm. you know smell or any or any sensation other than being alive as like a ghost in the machine. You know, mm. oh, drive so your best. Bad. You best start mm -hmm. believing in ghost stories, Eldred. Yeah. You're living in one. Yeah. <laughs> Epic. <laughs> um, I guess more on Tomb Worlds, because I kind of went over that a little too fast. They have, many of them have something called a Null Field Matrix, uh, which keeps the Tomb Worlds safe from psychers. And this also works against demons and tyranids and other psychers. And the technology can kind of be seen more in... Their ships, they put these weird bone things on their ships that ward off psychers so they can't see them as well from the astropath perspective. And they have the like gloom prisms on the tomb spiders. So they have anti psyker stuff. And Necrons are very good opponents against demons and Tyranids, as it would appear. <clears throat> so they're kind of... The Necrons might be the only hope for the galaxy to actually beat the Tyranids. But there's a slight, in my opinion. There's a slight irony to it in which the Necrons don't understand psychic stuff at all. 
Yeah. Because they have literally none of them are psychers, none of them have the abilities of psychers in any capacity. Mm-hmm. So they don't they, they know how to fight against it in certain like in terms of preventing it, but actually they're some even on the tabletop they're somewhat kind of vulnerable to it unless they mm-hmm. can't really deny anything in the psychic phase unless you have yeah. like one it's artifact or, yeah yeah i mean no psychic phase anymore baby so yeah i say yeah, no psychics anymore i mean they're <laughs> still there they're, Big they're still yeah. but what, wasn't that the whole sorry that wasn't that the whole thing of like the war in heaven like they made the orcs and they were like this is getting the job done kind of and then they went eldar and they're like oh this is much yeah. better like they can't counter this mm-hmm that's they do have. Trouble. They, they point right. Kane in their general direction, like "Go get him, <laughs> <laughs> go get him, good boy, good boy, good Kane." He's a biscuit. Literally, that meme video. The guy's like, "Describe that dog." He just like you guys. I was like, "This one." He just starts right growling aggressively at the camera, like, <laughs> like that one. Oh, Kane, Kane during the War in Heaven was actually a pit bull named Princess. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. Oh, man. But the, the Necrons do kind of have magic powers, but they use math to <laughs> create. Magic yeah, it's, powers, real, like, it's like real. Yeah. It's real power, isn't it? It's it literally yeah, science. I, I, they like bend reality and use the force of reality to do things that appear as magic to us, but we just can't understand or fathom how incredibly advanced they are. So it it's completely un- impossible to understand how they really do it. Well, I'll talk about cryptex a little bit later. Where was I? I think one of my favorite things in the lore that, um, before the Necrons wake up are the Triarch Praetorians. Uh, the Triarch Praetorians are basically enforcers of the will of the Triarch, um, which is not as big deal anymore. But before the Necrons woke up, the Triarch Praetorians saw that they failed their task of keeping the dynasties alive and was kind of keeping them on their former glory. And so they ne- they never went to sleep. They stayed awake for the entire 65 million years, and they actually spread the culture of Necron to your society, to the lesser races, to uh, just random aliens around the galaxy, so that if the Necrons didn't wake up, if that chance, that tiny little chance happened, that the Necron to your culture would live on and it would survive, which is pretty, pretty neat if you ask me. And they would later go and help the... Tomb Worlds awaken. They usually stay around and defend the Tomb World or help the them f- get rid of the you know lesser beings, uh, the fleshlings around the Tomb World's planet. They're the executioners of the High Court because there's kind of... I, I don't know what the state of it is right now that the Silent King is back. I assume he has full authority. But before the Silent King was back, they made kind of a de facto like government of just Necron nobles from the previously awakened dynasties um, who woke up before they were supposed to, and this was kind of spearheaded by the Triarch Praetorians and some nobles. Um, I, I, no, I'll talk about that later. I was going to say I'll go talk about the Infinite and the Divine, but I'll do that in a couple minutes. Uh, so as the Necrons are waking up, it would appear, according to my 5th edition Necrons Codex, uh, the first contact with the Imperium seems to be in 793.m41, when an Inquisitor comes to investigate why Solemnins, Trazen's planet, was completely ignored by High Fleet Behemoth. In Fall of Damnos, though, it kinda... It seems as if the Imperium had never encountered the Necrons before. Maybe that's because the Fall of Damnos is old lore, but it's hard to say because in the Codex it also says the Silver Skulls fought against the Necrons before Damnos I mean, happened. I think at a stretch you could probably say that Ferris Man is trunked one with that that incident where he got his arms but that's probably the only recorded one i suppose yeah could also just you know the imperium's record keeping is uh shall we say a a bit rough yeah 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 i mean to be honest i'm just imagine i know we've already mentioned this meme loads of times on the channel but just like the the mechanicum guy walking in seeing an electron goes what the hell is even that (laughs) (laughs) basically or or it just could be a case of like we know they encountered them before, but in universe mm-hmm. the Necron just wiped them to a man. So mm-hmm. it was yeah. like, well, no one to report it. Yeah, <laughs> they were they were flare virus food, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, what was I saying though? Damnos was one of the first times that it happened, and it has a book. So all those random Silver Skull stories in the Codex, I'm not sure if they're in a book or not. And the Silver Skulls are real, by the way. I remember a long time ago when I made a Silver Skulls chapter. People in the comments are saying, I don't think these guys are real. I think that they're just the oh. Trazen myth, but no, they're, they're real. They're definitely real. They're all real. Oh, definitely yeah. real. Yeah. yeah. They were replaced 
with trays in, in like the stained glass window and stuff, but they are indeed a real Space Marine chapter. Um, which, uh, yeah, before I talk about the dynasties, maybe how you can talk about the Infinite and the Divine, because they technically woke up before everyone else, so if you want to talk about them now, you can. Yes, I do. Well, uh, this is, by the way, if you are new to Warhammer or you're possibly just, you know, have a, like a toe in or maybe know a little bit, this is probably one of the better Warhammer books, like, ever in general. It's such a good book. I'm not going to say it's the best book in the world, but it's um, it's an incredibly enjoyable book. And even if you don't know anything about Warhammer lore, this is a really fun read and a listen. So I kind of won't give away everything. I'm just going to go, like, a light sort of going over the book. So Because, again, it'd be such a missed opportunity if you never got to uh, listen to this book yourself. But... The Infinite and the Divine is essentially following the characters of uh, Trazin or Trazin. I can't remember which one it really is, but I'm going to say Trazin from now on. Uh, it's Abaddon or Abaddon yeah. or Gilliman or Gulliman or blah, blah, blah. It's not Gulliman. <laughs> it's just we'll not. get told Guy off either way by someone in the comments. Uh, so <laughs> Trazin, the Infinite, and Oricon, the Diviner, or basically the Infinite and the Divine. Um, it's essentially two characters that were... Uh, around during the early early days of the um the, what's it, the time when obviously the necron tier became the necrons it's essentially a plot uh, the general plot is it's a feud between the old married couple that is trezin and oregon <laughs> who have at the core of it kind of different ideas and philosophies about their race and how they act so they are kind of the two different uh they're, they're meant to show a contrast between how the Necrons have changed and how they feel about their past and their future. And it's really, it's literally in every conversation that they have because they're just, they literally, they're so petty and they bicker <laughs> so much and it's so enjoyable. And the book will, it follows the general journey around the mysterious tomb, the lost tomb of Nefreth. I think I'm, I'm saying that correctly. And they both desire the secrets within and they both have awakened slightly earlier than a, a lot of the other Necrons. Again, like as Eli said, sometimes the process is not perfect. Um, I think they awakened possibly during at some time. I, oh, is they, it, uh, guys they, they woke up around the time of the Horus Heresy. There's some stuff yeah. Trazen says uh, and the fact that he has perfect recreations yeah. of the Horus Heresy. That uh, pretty strongly hint that if even if they weren't there for the start of it, they woke up during it. Also, in fact, I think and uh, there's ahead. actually a, oh sorry. If no, I, go, uh, no, go ahead, go ahead. There's a line where Trazen was talking about how before the Horus Heresy, he found mankind to be incredibly boring. Yeah, because it kind of the Great Crusade made everything much more uniform, and he was like, oh, "But I already have Space Marines, bro." Um, but we should mention as well. Uh, Trazen's thing is like he he makes them museum world he runs his museum world of solemn nace if i'm saying that correctly um it's an entire world that's literally a museum and it's a museum of history there's all kinds of crazy um things in there like things from the war in heaven all the way up to modern uh i timeline. think uh, they actually woke up before the fall of the eldar actually not long before but uh because orican mentions in the book he had to basically go meditate for a century straight after he realized what the hell the Elder had done because it freaked him out that much. <laughs> I think also Tristan had to grab loads of things very quick. And he said when he was the heresy yeah. happened, he had to grab loads of things. And yeah. um, Trace them on, gotta catch him. Oregon <laughs> like, is... I'm having this, I'm having this. Doesn't he like nick something from Istvan or something like that? I'm sure oh, yeah, definitely. Like, he's like a salamander like a and things like that. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, an Oricon, his opposite is a cryptic, so he kind of his specialty is like he has he has the power of science essentially, and he can manipulate uh, time. I like science. He, um, he, time travel. He he does. There is time travel within Necrons, but it is it does have some rules on it. Like they can't go back, like change entire uh, things. But essentially, Oricon can rewind time or on himself and see d divinate some things in the future too. Also, you have saying con. So it's uh, it's very much you need to know exactly what you're doing and have some level of strength and expertise 
And they make a point of saying that while Orkin can do it, he's pretty much the only one who can so reliably go back and fudge the numbers, as it were, to make sure things turn out how he uh, wants it to, which is also part of why he's such a good diviner. Because uh, he cheats. Because he goes, you know, he, the time goes forward, and then he goes back in time. He's oh, like, yeah. I'm seeing this. <laughs> he's like, this will happen, everyone, and then it happens because he saw it happen. Speaking of he's uh, master that, troll, <laughs> speaking of that though, we I do want to mention uh, as they the rivalry begins between them because they want to battle over the secrets of the tomb of Nefreth. There is uh, basically everything gets taken up in the wake of their just complete absurd uh, shenanigans. They even cause problems on a world named Serenade, which started off as a maiden world in the beginning of the book, filled with um, Eldar Exodites, which are kind of... Uh, we'll, we'll explain more about them, I think, more in a Eldar-specific video, because they they're actually kind of their own cool subject. And, and uh, then it's eventually... The world is essentially... feels the wrath of these two playing games and shenanigans. They literally will spit in on each other if they could, and they literally are so petty and they insult each other throughout the book that he... Uh, the world of Serenade has a, is it is, sorry, set up by Eldar, then by humans, and eventually some gene stealers show up at some point. Again, not too spoilery, and they commit loads of war crimes against each other. Uh, again, <laughs> it's from the there's a my favorite ones are like um, they eventually are forced to work together at some point, and uh, Trezin because he's such a goofball, he uh, <laughs> throws a gene stealer at Oricon whilst he's meditating because he thought it'd be funny. <laughs> and that ends up causing massive problems for the world. And then um, there's also one with Oricon, um, as I said earlier, there was like a preliminary like court system established as the some of the Necrons are waking up early. And um, Trezina took Oricon to court for breaking into his museum. And yeah, Oricon I... proceeds to rewind time so that he therefore he doesn't lose the argument. And everyone's like going like... What? What's going on? And if, like, there's like something weirds happening. Like, I feel <laughs> odd. And he's noticing like something, something on a uh, Oricon's is it his staff or like, one of his tools is like burning red hot. And it's like yeah, it's one it's of being the things Grayson is and wearing. He's like, why is it so hot? Yeah, and Oricon is actually rewinding time so he can win the argument. And they eventually do work together. They're forced to work together by the other Necron court because they're just like, listen. Uh, you guys are just so petty that we just we can't deal with you anymore. So they've forced them to work together under pain of like being yeah. erased. And I, there's a really, also, really like those characters who are just like, you two are being children. Could you stop messing around <laughs> for five minutes? They're even, it's the, so funny. The judge even says like, we're going to punish you in the worst way we possibly can. We're going to make you work with each other. Yes. Yeah, yeah. They are eventually forced to work together. And to be fair, it's actually really. Um, probably one of the better parts of the book just because the, they complement each other so well with Trezin's like infinite sort of resources and his ability to like blink into other Necrons and sort of become like to over like basically take over a Necron and Oricon's powers which are incredibly useful but to their horror they do discover there's a dark truth behind the tomb of Nefreth which I won't spoil here because again if someone wanted to like if you're about reading Warhammer books this is the book to start with in terms of it's just so um it, it'll start you on a big journey and you'll be we'll, we'll be there holding your hand and you'll love it so much um but just a few things about the book i thought was interesting that the book does show the inc the intricacies of necron life how their memories as a necron is perfect so they remember everything like a machine would but their time when they were necron tier feels like a dream kind of like they remember it like how you wake up and you kind of remember your dream, but then throughout the day, if someone asked you, like, oh, what happened in your dream? And it's like, oh, the details are more fuzzy. It's memories um, of memories of memories, yeah. basically. And it's a bit, they all feel a bit sad about that as well. Like, they're kind of like, oh, I, I don't really remember who I was before. And it also showed the different ideas, as I mentioned in the beginning, about how uh, they'd have different ideas or well, there's different aspects of Necrons now who feel differently about being Necrons. So some of them are like Trezin's probably one of the few who are actually like okay with it. Remorse. Yeah. <laughs> or uh, Trezin's funny enough, he actually like in somewhat enjoys being an immortal because he wants to be a museum uh, curator and being an immortal robot is kind of perfect for that. Whereas Oricon 
doesn't. I mean, he was against, like, as Eli said earlier, he was against the transformation. And that is, the, the secrets behind the tomb is sort of linked to how they both see the future for the Necron race. Again, I don't want to spoil uh, too much of that because it's such, such a good book. And they, yeah, they sort of have different, it's an interesting conclusion about some of them want to, maybe some could embrace flesh again, but then some of them are like, why would I want to eventually die and get old and stuff like that? And then others go, but what if we ascended to a higher form of existence? And then there's like, right. oh, and then some of them, sometimes they find out what that would really be like. And it's kind of horrifying too. But again, no more spoilers than that. Um, but, don't, care, don't care going ahead anyways. Do yes. you want a raisin quote? It's a long one, but it's oh. like a classic from the fifth edition Codex type of quote. Is like. it? Is it a letter he wrote by chance? Yeah, yeah, it's a classic. <laughs> this one's great. Well, then Colin can read. Colin oh, can enjoy you. this. All right. I hope I didn't interrupt anything important. No, no, I, I, was, I was finished there too. So this is the okay. perfect, perfect ending. Here's your, here's your. Oh, one. I love this quote. <laughs> <clears throat> Dear lady, let me express my fulsome appreciation for your most generous gift. It is so very rare to discover another of my own kind that appreciates my work. Therefore, to find understanding amongst a member of another race is nothing short of a revelation. I realize that you briefly trod my galleries, but the fact that you spotted in so short a time that my Acabrius War Collection was lacking three regiments of Catacan warriors reveals that you truly have a collector's eye for detail. And to send five regiments... Such generosity will allow me to weed out and replace a few of the more substandard pieces in my collection. If I might level a minor criticism, the instructions issued to your gift were manifestly not as clear as you thought, as most of them had to be forcibly restrained. Sadly, it seems that the lower orders will always behave like an army of invasion, whether that be their purpose or not. However, this is a minor complaint and seems almost churlish under the circumstances, so please allow me to repay your gift with one of my own. Accompanying this message is the Hyperstone Maze, one of the series of Tesseract Labyrinths constructed at the height of the Charnavok Dynasty. That, that took me a minute. It is a trinket, really, only of interest to scholars such as you and I, but I trust you will find it amusing. Assuming you have the wit to escape its clutches, of course. What a fucking goblin he is. <laughs> <laughs> Master troll. When we said he was oh, petty, gosh. we forgot to mention he's conniving, too. <laughs> Wait. Wait. Tom and Jerry, except Tom has the power of the star god. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. Oh man, I'm I'm like going through my old codex right now. There's a quote on like every other page. What the heck happened to Games Workshop, man? Whatever. I'm just, I'll always be salty about that kind of stuff. But they had to sell more Primaris Space Marine lieutenants. That's all that happened. So they, so they lost. They lost the cool codex budget. <laughs> it's something I've talked about like every day but you know how it would be so back to the Necrons in the 41st millennium as <laughs> they've all woken up now that these guys are done oh, one one thing actually I think one of my favorite parts of the book is the scale of time that things happen in like the events that Trazen and Orkin go through happen hundreds sometimes like thousands of years apart sometimes Orkin will be like oh it's been 200 years and Trazen hasn't tried to break into my uh like studies that's so nice and then 300 years later he sends like a comet and then 400 years later he sends another, yeah stuff like that the scale of time because they are literally immortal and likely they're never going to die uh bar you know extreme accidents so time is quite irrelevant to the necrons indeed and their court system is basically just an exaggerated version of our court system and uh, Trazen was saying, like, oh, man, this is going to take forever. Our regular court case takes, like, a thousand years. And we were so lucky to get this done in a hundred years type of thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, another funny part. I'm spoiling. Maybe this isn't a spoiler. Whatever. Funny part that I thought was um, they don't they don't use chairs. They just turn their legs off and basically sit in their legs. That was fun. So, yeah, they're, they're tireless bodies. They're better than us in every single way you could ever imagine. Don't worry about it. So they don't have souls. Oh you know, yeah, that is you know so they're actually worse than us in every single way. But that's kind of the that's kind of the lesson the lesson that you learn from the Necrons. You should also read the Twice Dead King books. They're my favorite Warhammer books. I think they're really really good. Uh, where are they? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's worth it. Literally is so. 
I think we we could get to the yeah the Necrons have woken up. They've been killing people, scaring people. Usually, a lot of times, the Tomb World will wake up on a recently habitated planet uh, where settlers have touched down, and now all of a sudden there are these horrifying skeletal demon robots crawling out of the ground and killing everyone, and they care for nobody. I think one of my favorite quotes is from... or a quote that you know sums up the Necrons very well is from one of the lords on Damnos, and it says, We are the Necrontier, we are Legion, we claim dominion of this world, surrender and die. And then in the book, the guy's like, surely they mean surrender or die, right? Uh, they did not mean that. They certainly did not. Necrons have no care at all for us. But we can talk about the dynasties now, I think, because we've kind of talked about the state that they're in. The main reason the Necrons have not taken over the universe is because they're they're jerks. They they hate each other. <laughs> they don't not say they hate each other, but there's so much there's literally rivalries from millions of years ago that they're still settling. Um and so politics like in most things is kind of slowing down everything and making their reawakening and taking over the galaxy a lot harder because half of the Necrons are fighting each other, which is so wasteful and stupid, obviously. But it's just how it is. The hierarchy of the Necrons goes the Triarch, which I'm pretty sure is now just the Silent King, and then Pharaons, which are rulers of the dynasties, then Overlords, which would be rulers of a cluster of planets or a system. They have many legions. A Lord is a ruler of a single world, and then there's random nobles of the courts of Lords and Overlords. Cryptex are usually in these courts, but they're more independent and they do whatever they want. Uh, the greater the court, the greater the lord's military might. And many nobles, it's like any aristocrat or bureaucracy, aristocracy, whatever. There's tons of different titles. Like in the book, one of the old guys had the title of like uh, he was the he was the head of the farms basically, which is obviously a completely useless title now. But because he has that title. By law, he's supposed to be given some Necron legions, so he has a few warriors to spare. Then, after the random nobles, he would go Lich Guard, and then Immortals, and then at the bottom of the chain would be Warriors. And then, I guess, Canoptics, I guess, but they're not really, they don't really count. So that's how, that's how they are right now. The Dynasties, uh, I have, like, I have a few of them that I wrote down basic things about them, because there's, like, literally hundreds of them, uh, some of them have lore, some of them have nothing. I fleshed out a little more in the recent age, I think largely because in 8th and 9th edition, you had sub-faction rules. They had to think up lore for these dynasties, finally, that they had to give different rules to Necrons. Um, but the main one is the Sautic dynasty. Also, the main one is the Caesarican dynasty. It's kind of hard to say which one is going to be the more powerful. I think they, they have a bit of a rivalry. The Caesarican dynasty is the Silent King's dynasty, um, who likely hold the most power and influence over the Necrons at the moment. They're not the biggest, because that's the Sotsek dynasty, but the Sarah can have the Silent King now that he's back. They contain a large amount of old relics and epic stuff. Then we have the Sotsek dynasty, which is the largest, due to their pharaon, Imhotep the Stormlord, the greatest commander and strategist in the entire galaxy. Tough stuff, fleshlings. They are implacable and unstoppable with him as their leader. And I have their hierarchies, their specific hierarchy right here. And this is going to be very boring to some people, but I think it's pretty cool, so whatever. Uh, Orkin the Diviner is the astromancer of their royal court. Imhotek is the Pharaon, of course. And then we have Nargrin, <laughs> Navgran the Eternal, who's the High Transmuter and Omni Mutander. <laughs> I don't know what half of the things mean, but it's uh, it's a good way to show the intricacies of the Necrons. And there's yeah, the typical Necrons of... are like, we're going to make it sound really over the top just to yeah. show off how smart we are. Like, yeah, good uh -huh. luck, come on. Hey, they sound <laughs> like cool names. Yeah, there's there's what Overlord Ogdavak, who's Overlord of the Sotsak Fringe Worlds. Fringe Worlds are um, worlds that are far away that are kind of... Because there's the core Crown World, and then there's the Core Worlds, and then there's the Fringe Worlds. The Fringe Worlds are kind of like outposts. Uh, then on the other side, there's Vargard Osiris, which is Bodyguard to Imhotek. Off to the side on his own. I want lore for this guy so bad. I don't think he has any because in his picture, it's a guy with a scythe 
on a skeleton horse and is, is Lord High Adjudicator Kremethel, enforcer of the codes of battle. What the heck? That sounds so cool. And then uh, on the second tier is Nemesaur is a Hendrick, probably the most fun Necron character. And then he is with Vargard O'Byron and a few other guys. We have the Corpse Lord, Viscount of the Blood Palace. Another cool sounding thing with no lore, probably. Uh, these all have like old classic arts too, so it, oh man, it's cool. There's a lot more on here, but I'm not going to read all of it because that would be kind of horrible. But <laughs> it's just kind of a good way to. Surprised they don't have like cube. um a Rub like the title of Rubik's Cube Polisher or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, they do. They literally have random titles for freaking everything, and some lords will surround themselves with like actual buffoons and goofballs who have like the most outlandish, like stupid titles that you would never even think of. But any court is better than no court, so it says in here. It's um, insane. Yeah, literally. The loneliness is probably the biggest issue for most Necrons nowadays, I would have, I would say. Aww. Yeah, because it uh, makes them crazy, and um, Ultex makes uh, the Twice Like King Overlord makes a point to talk to his legions, even though they don't care. And many... Because many lords and overlords go insane because they just stop talking because there's no actual need for it. In, in fact, to be inefficient to speak. But yeah. Uh, we, next, we have the Mephrit dynasty, which is where Enrique the Traveler comes from. They're experts at harnessing the power of stars, and they have technology that can make stars go supernova. They were greatly employed in the War of Heaven due to this ability because they could literally end solar systems with like their bare hand not their bare hands but you know what i mean they can make things that end solar systems and they can still do that theoretically uh novak which is my personal tabletop favorite because they're the melee guys they're bloody and murderous fighters and they give credit to the ancient rites of blooding which is very unnecrony uh the lore, the lore is very hard to it, is, it can it's very inconsistent through novels and codexes and stuff it's kind of hard to tell what other what not what some necrons think of flesh and what others think um, so it's but they remember the <laughs> yeah inconsistent and convoluted. yeah they remember the ancient rites so they paint their armor in red and fight in close quarters combat with a lot of warrior pride and there's the Nefric dynasty uh, their crown world has trinary stars which I assume it means it has it's a solar system with three stars I guess um, and they use this as an energy source to fuel their crazy mad not actual magic but cryptic magics as they've unlocked this thing called Metagold, so their legions are all gold and glittering, and they're masters of translocation, which is another thing. Phase shifting um, is something the Necrons are really good at, and it's more impossible technology. It projects the person out of reality and in reality at the same time, so it would be like constantly, so when you hit them, they're, they're out of reality, so they're invulnerable in a sense. Anyways, the Nihilic Dynasty uh, contains the head of a Yithseer, which is uh, some kind of Xenos creature, but they use this preserved head to scry the future because it's a future scene head, which is freaking cool. Uh, sometimes it's spiteful, though, so it'll lie to them just as much as it tells the truth at times. <laughs> Their realm is taken by lesser beings, so they now are very war-hungry and march relentlessly to reclaim their territory. And lastly, the Obdebeck dynasty... Just a fun shout out to those guys. They're expert craftsmen and stone workers. Uh, and their skill has carried over to the time of the machine as they have some great necromancers and wield big old hammers. It's just fun and cool. The Obzibek Lord in the books is lots of fun. The main weapon of the Necrons is the Gauss weapons. Gauss weapons, sorry. I said it wrong in a video and I was uh, hung and corded for it. Um, these weapons completely destroy an enemy by breaking them apart atom by atom. And the green energy blasts work all the way down to the molecular bonds of a being, allowing them to destroy the toughest enemies, and they can even pierce through vehicles. The old rules, tabletop rules, had it so that your gal's weapons could basically do uh, haul points to any vehicle, no matter their armor value, I'm pretty sure. I think you just had to roll a six. Uh... Being shot by these weapons is like one of the most extremely painful and to die in the whole galaxy. Um, yeah, they create magnetic tensions that cause atomic tearing of the victim. Not bad. So, that's the dynasties. That's kind of the state of Necrons right now. So the Necrons, when you read their books, they're kind of... They seem pretty normal. Not normal. They have their issues, but... Quite human, in a way. They, they're, yeah, they're human they're human to them but if you read it from a human perspective they are like death incarnate they are 
these horrifying skeletal monsters that crawl up from the ground and descend upon the planets, and they're absolutely yeah. horrifying. Which that is ninth uh, edition it's a cool trailer. Link. It's down to a T. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, the old Necrons were even scarier. They had a lot less personality and were a lot more destroyer e. I didn't get to read through my third edition Necrons codex before this, which makes me really sad because old Necron lore is kind of baller. But the new Necron lore is cool too. I think that sums up the dynasties pretty well. Um, so we can go talk about characters now because I think this is already over an hour and something. And talking yeah. about characters, <laughs> two, two hours. Minutes. <laughs> Me too. What? Wait, what? Hour forty nine. Yeah. Yep. Oh, I, I can't wait to edit this, guys. <laughs> surely, <laughs> You're in surely I will. Surely I will see the gates of Baldur someday. <laughs> <laughs> Look, oh, look okay. it'll you'll you'll be saved all the anger when Shadowheart misses her tenth consecutive attack. <laughs> Useless. Oh man, I want to throw goblins at people. I love goblins. <laughs> Anyways, we're, I'm not. We shouldn't get off a track. This is so long. Um, let's get into the characters. Hal can talk about the most important one because I somehow know almost none of his lore. Yeah. Recently, at least, is the Silent King. Good old uh, Sarek or Cesarek. Oh. It's hard, and everyone pronounced it differently, but I'm going to go with um, Cesarek of the Zarakin dynasty, which was the Silent King, known as the last Silent King of the Necron tier slash Necrons. He was the one who basically made the deal with the Kitan. So, as I said before, like some other, there have been other Silent Kings um, throughout much of Necron tier history, but he would be the last and probably the final one ever. And obviously, we, he's. I think Eli mentioned it earlier, he's called the Silent King because he doesn't talk to anyone other than his triarch, so he sort of whispers to them. That's why he's obviously very, seems like a silent ruler. And, uh, you know, he was the one, he, he ultimately it's on his shoulders. Like I said earlier, he feels a lot of guilt for sort of agreeing to the Catan's deal and his, uh, he's famous obviously particularly more for his uh, act of vengeance for destroying the Catan into shards Sorry, just roughly shattering them into shards. Um, but since that, you're probably thinking, well, where has he been the entire time? Why is he not? A bit was he asleep? Was he asleep in the stasis too? Uh, he wasn't. He just felt loads of obviously reasonable guilt for what he had done to his people. So after the Catan was shattered, he uh, severed the command protocol within within him, so he could not forcibly command any of the Necrons. And he left the Milky Way galaxy for millions of years. And this is not just him wandering, but obviously possibly in ships. And it's still somewhat mysterious about what he did in that time. Obviously, 65 million years is, or 60 million years is possibly a long, long, long time. So we don't know what he saw or did. But it's somewhat implied that he saw the Tyranid threat. And that is the ultimate reason why he's returned to the Milky Way galaxy. Because... You know, the Necrons do believe in a sort of divine right to rule, but there's nothing to rule if the Tyranids eat it all. Not very good. Um, so he ultimately seeks again to unify his people. Uh, the Silent King, uh, Zarek, has also met Dante of the Blood Angels. It's a one of the first few meetings of the Necrons with the Imperium. And it's actually quite a cool scene because Dante... And the Blood Angel are fighting the Necrons originally on this planet. And they're like basically cronking through them. And suddenly all the Necrons just stop. And like they go, what the hell's going on? And the Necrons basically say, this is an error in calculations. Come meet with the Silent King. And they're all like, oh, the Silent King. I thought it was a rumor. I didn't know there was an actual king of the Necrons. And they kind of go to meet the Silent King. And they approach up to Zarek and... They actually have bombs planted in like their uh the tank that they rode up in. They have like triggers in their gauntlets. And Dante thinking, if I could take out the Silent King here, you know, it's all you know, that'd be great. We did it. And then it'll be a good win for the Imperium. And then they look upon the Silent King and he's wearing a mask of Sanguinius. One that's eerily similar to the one that Dante has, but it's of uh Sanguinius smiling. And it's the Silent King he actually stops whispers to Dante. Like, like, obviously, the Silent King, by the way, as a model, even as a regular Necron, he's actually huge. He's like just a little bit bigger than even some of the bigger Necrons. So he like sort of creeps down to Dante, like whispering into him, like you know, I, you know, 
Hey, like, hey, buddy, we need to make a deal. Sort of thing. <laughs> a little bit, um, a little bit, uh, godfathery. And <laughs> it's implied that, he, oh, the Silent King implies that he possibly met Sanguinius and he liked Sanguinius. But again, we don't know if he's yeah, lying or not. That's ringing a bell, isn't it? He might yeah. be, he might be lying. We don't, we don't know. Um, but obviously he's wearing a mask of Sanguinius. I mean, and the, so that they agreed to make a deal with the Blood Angels to fight off the Tyranids. And it's implied that the his whole purpose of returning is to unite his people and somewhat face the Tyranid threat. Because obviously the, the Necrons do plan to awaken from the tombs and rule. And obviously Tyranids eating all their tomb worlds and eating all the plates that they want to rule over is no good. So he has returned to the setting and he has some delicious Catan shards in prisons because he is the one who helped kill them or shatter them so he is a so he's he's a cool tar- character and obviously his tabletop model is uh ginormous huge and worth over a hundred smackaroonies so um it's a birthday slash uh christmas gift for any necron players out there check it out after this if you're thinking about <laughs> getting some big purchases um but eli will mm. talk about some other really cool uh, characters obviously we mentioned yeah. Oricon and uh trezin there's a bit more on them mm-hmm. i'm sure but we'll just go over if you want yeah to. i can yeah i also have a quote that i forgot to uh send earlier this is a really short one maybe you know how, how can we how hasn't read a quote yet it's this altix says this when he's fighting against space marines is that in hashtag general mm-hmm. let me see this they're still using solid munitions how did these primitives ever leave orbit? Damn. Yeah, that's right. Energy, boys. We're just, Energy. We're all just monkeys to these guys. So going down the line, the second most important Necron would be Imotech, the Storm Lord. He has a cool quote. So I like my Ooh. quotes. What can I say? It says, order, unity, obedience. We taught the galaxy these things long ago, and we will do so again. Imhotek has recently risen, only to find his dynasty, the Sautek dynasty, engulfed in a civil war. Because the Sautek dynasty opened up, uh, you know, the caskets, and everyone was killing each other. So they eventually severed the... What's the word? Sorry. The regeneration... The reanimation protocols of all the nobles. um, Because it was getting so ridiculous, and they stopped waking everyone up. So Imhotek was woken up by a specifically ambitious overlord noble random guy and he was hoping that he's like oh i'm gonna wake up Imhotek, and he's gonna be so thankful that i will come up in this time and he's gonna help me win the war instead Imhotek wakes up and he sees what's going on and he's not happy he immediately kills this noble and he musters his own armies and ends the civil war basically overnight because he's just that good uh and he has since ravaged his way through the immediate galaxy i think he's Done something like conquered 80 plus planets in the last century. Something like ridiculous like that. His brain is just incomprehensible, vast logic compendium. uh, Where he can, the processing power would kill a human being, basically. If they were to be able to think as he does. He can stage a counter defense on one world. While leading, personally leading an attack on another, and then counter maneuvering someone else uh, like across the galaxy all at the same time, he can summon these lightning storms that cause complete fear and utter dismay for the people who go in them. And the people who go in them might come out with bl- blood storm nano scarabs inside of them, which will attract flayed ones to them. Uh, he's been kind of crusading through the galaxy, waking up tomb worlds, and oftentimes. Necronormals will just immediately bend the knee because they know they have no chance of uh, beating this guy. He has defeated every grand strategist. I don't know if he's actually ever lost a battle. It's I think the book says that he hasn't. As Warhammer, of course, you never know. Um, but specifically, mm-hmm. Hellbrecht was the uh, you know. Oh, we cheated. Big, today's today's big loser is uh, yeah, Mr. <laughs> Hellbrecht. Today's big loser. Uh, and I have, have a quote. For him, I wish I could send this to Andy, but I have to type it all out. I'll just read it as it is. This is him speaking to Marshal Helbrecht during the battle for Schrodinger. That's a planet, I guess. Uh, You have ruled this galaxy for 10,000 years, yet have little of account to show for your efforts. Such failures must be as depressing to bear as it is pathetic to behold. Freaking got him, dude. 
Yeah, but then yeah. he like wrecked his like flagship later on, so it's like, ah, revenge. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. he got some. He he's, he's, he's like the back. Cetra of a Necron. Yeah, 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 yeah. I wonder if him and the Silent King will have kind of a standoff or even a fight. We'll have to find probably. out. Probably. I don't. Know. But, I don't think they like each other much. Well, <laughs> Emotech probably doesn't like him. Yeah. The he has two. He has one thing that goes against his very logistical brain or whatever you want to call it for the Necrons, he has quite the warrior pride. And instead of killing opponents, he will often, like he did to Helbrecht, cut off his hand and then run away laughing after utterly defeating them because he just like drinks in their despair and shame of losing and he wants to do it again sometime. And he had fun beating them type of thing. Isn't he also the crazy? Only... He's, like, he's actually like bonkers. Like he thinks you know he's still... Doesn't he think oh, he's still... Oh, that's a different, different Necron. Yes, we'll talk about him in a second. Oh, okay. But in the times of flesh, so he was so incredible of a command, brutal of a commander was this guy that there was a Necron idiom, I think is the word, like a metaphor that was based off of him. It was called Gone Like the Kuvu, which is an enemy dynasty that Imhotek had completely wiped out. And they use, they say this when they completely finish their plate of food. So if you like wipe a plate clean, you'll say, it's gone like the Kuvu for your dinner. Um, Yeah. He's balling, dude. He's freaking cool. Even the old ones were afraid to hear of him, it was said. The old ones, these godlike beings, were afraid of one dude. Man, I sure love Mr. Imhotek, the Stormlord. I read a... commander in the galaxy. I read a theory online, no. just a theory, so don't take this as canon, Um, but that uh, the only enemy he really can't predict is the orcs. Yeah, well, I was going to say, uh, I was gonna say that. that is, that's not a theory, that's real. <laughs> Oh no no that's not the like the theory was that like the orcs were specifically made to counteract uh oh. uh Imotech because the old ones are like we we can't this guy sucks i hate <laughs> dealing with him he's he's the worst so they like the theory goes they made the crork just you know the oh. stupid dumb brutes cuz they're t- basically mm-hmm. too stupid for him to plan around that's a fun theory i've never yeah i i sorry i interrupted you uh i was going to say though yeah his the orcs He's so perfectly logical and predict every single movement. The only way to have a chance against Imhotek is to completely put no decision into anything you do and do random garbage. And that's what the orcs do. So he gets really tilted when he has to fight against the orcs because he just can't predict their next move. That is a fun theory. At the same time, the Quark were probably a lot smarter than the orcs, I feel like. It was, yeah, it was just like a oh, online it's theory. A, like, it's it's a, it a it sounds theory. cool. I think it's fun, yeah. We'll go with that theory. <laughs> so, all right, right under Imhotek is the next greatest general in the galaxy, Mr. Mm. Nemesor Zandrik, who is probably my favorite Necron character. He is... Arguably, he's potentially better than Imhotek, but it's kind of hard to say because, you know, he's the best tactician. Imhotek's the best tactician. Uh, John's the best tactician. You know, you know. It go on and on and how it goes in Warhammer. But Nemesar Zandrek is one of, if not the best tactician in the galaxy, probably along with guys like the Lion and Azerman and the likes. His little quirk, though, is that he's actually crazy in a way. He's he's very uh, he's very intelligent and, you know, he knows how to talk. He does. He's he's not that kind of crazy, but he's crazy in the fact that he is constantly living in the past and he perceives reality as if he was still in the time of flesh. So when he's fighting other beings, he sees them as um, enemy dynasties who are part of a civil war. And so he abides to all the codes of combat, making him probably one of the most honorable combatants in the entire galaxy. He'll capture enemy commanders instead of killing them and like feed them, put them in his nice cozy little prison and talk to them and hang out with them. He's fun. He's co- accompanied by Vargard Oberon, Oberon, who is his lumbering, towering lich guard, uh, very almost kind of like a lord, I guess, uh, bodyguard who helps the Nemesaur in every single way possible. He's always at his side, and when he's not, he has a ghost walk mantle which allows him to travel across the plains and right appear beside Nemesaur once again. And but he doesn't only protect him on the field of battle, he also protects him in the realm of politics because it makes sense that Nemesaur is not really, uh, he's not really great at politics with his state of mind. But Oberon makes sure to get to shoot down any political ploys and kill any assassins with ease. He's really fun, and he's a very cool character on the tabletop and whatnot. In interaction with the White Scars, didn't they, with Corsaro? And they, they had a little bit of a scuffle. 
that sounds cool. I've not read that book, but now I would like to. Yeah. He's like, and he escapes, and then the the the, ne- the guy in charge of the bodyguard's like, "I'll let you go because you're cool." He's like, "Okay, <laughs> bye." <laughs> here's here's a fun little Sandrick quote. Sorry, with all the quotes, I just love him so much. He says, "See, Oberon, the Separatists come, attempting to outflank me, just as they did at the Fourth Battle of Vindak." How they calculate that daubing themselves green and roaring like savages will produce a different outcome. I cannot fathom, but it is of no account. Ready, my legions. Another glorious victory shall be ours. And he's saying this prior to the crushing defeat of Wa Bloodtooth. Funny guy. Think, and... uh, yes? I uh, I read a... I don't know if it was his creator, but someone who wrote a story for him said he was based kind of off his uncle who had uh, dementia. Oh, interesting. And uh, because it's like, I think there's a passage where, like, Zandrick kind of, for a moment, he's talking to Oberon. He's like, if we really were turned into, you know, unfeeling metal space Egyptian Terminators, wouldn't it be better to just pretend we weren't and enjoy life for what it is? Mm -hmm. And I think it's like the thing, because, like, with dementia, there can be moments where you're briefly, like, they're loose. Yeah, like, where they're, they're old cells, but then they fade in and out. So I think that was kind of the vibe they were going for with Zantrek, the creator. He was like, he's sometimes he's playing it up a bit, but other yeah. times he really does just not have his full faculties, oh. which is very interesting. It, it it's good, but also just sad. Yeah, mm. I really like him. He's one of my favorite characters. I think need more lore on him. They're also Next. dabbing. Did you say dabbing? Yeah, he's dabbing. Look at him. Oh yeah, you know you're right. Actually, <laughs> he is in the picture. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have the oh codex open right now on his picture. He probably is one of those <laughs> my how you doing, fellow kids kind of guys. Yeah. I bet. <laughs> oh, I just, so I just saw the movie. So nice. <laughs> Love me, Nemesaur Zandrick. Next down the line is Illuminor Caesaris, who's basically Necron Fabius Bile, which is like just a horrible combination. Obviously, he is all the bad parts of Fabius Bile. And none of the good parts. He what, <laughs> what good parts? <laughs> he's pretty uh, reprehensible. Uh, Fabius is bad. I don't know. He's got that going for him at least. Fabius has some great to him. This guy's got none. He does. This guy's just a jerk. He's really awful. Um, his whole thing is that he thinks the Necrons are on a path of evolution, and biotransference was just part of that evolutionary process. Uh, he's kind of has the same opinion as. Orkin, I think, is that he wants to evolve the Necron race to beings of light and, like, godhood, basically. Um, So he's constantly trying to find the mysteries of life. But since he himself is not alive, he will probably never find them. Using the great technology that the Necron has, he can keep all of his subjects alive as he performs the most horrific surgeries and tests on them that you could ever think of. For he doesn't, he has no interest in dead things. He's trying to find the mysteries of life. Theoretically, he's still making pariahs, which are a sort of retcons, not really, retcon Necron unit, where they would take blanks of other races, mostly humans, and put them through biotransference to make these pariahs, and it was kind of like their anti-psychers thing, and they were, just, they were kind of like mini Eversor, that's not the right assassin, they were mini whatever assassins, you know, the blank ones, uh, but as Necrons, so they were really cool units that are not really in the lore, but recently Cesaris talked, or like captured a, a that kind of assassin. Is it a Nemesaur assassin? Is that what they're called? I can't remember the top of my about? head. Uh, oh, yeah, I think that. Eversaur. Eversaur, so. Nemesaur. Eversaur is the crazy one. I, it's not a big deal. We should, I, I should hurry it up. <laughs> um, next, I'm, I'm talking about all of them, because they're all really cool characters, and we can go through it quickly. Anarchir the Traveler is another one of my favorites. Spoiler alert, all the characters are my favorite. But he <laughs> is one of the more noble Necrons. He probably has the most noble cause of all the Necrons, because he is currently traveling the galaxy with his Pyrian Eternals, his, lit, his uh, personal immortals. And he's going around waking up all the Necrons that he can, and try, he's trying to unite the dynasties once again. He's from the Mephrit dynasty. And his coolest thing is probably that he has some kind of strange power over machine spirits. Where he can just kind of like put his hand out and take control of a vehicle. And shoot with his guns. Even on on the tabletop they kind of like, they kind of like cucked the ability which is too bad. It used to be that he could shoot with vehicles weapons. But now it's just the vehicle can't shoot or it has minus one to hit. But whatever. 
he's a fun character and he's very unique. He kind of just goes off on his own and does his own thing. And we talked about Trazen, the Collector, and Orkin, the Astromancer. Yeah. And then the other, on that topic, they have Cryptex, who are the kind of techno-sorcerer, mathematician wizards of the Necrons, who is or are impossible to comprehend. They're kind of like the physicians of the Necrons. They treat the all the crazy symptoms of madness that they have and try to fix them the best they can. In the Twice Dead King book, the guy gives Ultix a this weird technology that lets him live his memories. But once he's lived them, they're gone forever, so he has to try to hold on to what he remembers of that memory. And other crazy stuff like that. They can control time, like Orkin. They can... There's plasmancy, there's technomancy, there's psychomancy. There's a whole bunch of different things. They're kind of independent dudes who wander around the galaxy doing their own thing. They're pretty cool. They also take care of tomb worlds and keep their upkeep. They are linked to every single organism, every single canoptic thing, and every single machine on the tomb world, and you can control all of it. So they're very important, and lords will generally suffer their goofiness to... Because they're just too important to keep around. Suffer their they, goofiness. <laughs> yeah, well, they're all very eccentric and weird, as a, you know, a techno sorcerer wizard would be. Unsurprisingly, uh, I'll briefly, very quickly go through the units because I know it's like two hours in. Um, lowest on the tree are the warriors, um, and some think that their wits were stripped from them so that they could be more easily controlled. Others just think it was a byproduct of biotransference because they were peasants, they were farmers. Before, they had no war experience, as I said. Their consciousness does lay far beyond and beneath the surface, uh, only enough to be in constant misery, but not enough to realize that they're in constant misery. Tough stuff. The Immortals are a bit of a step up. They're tougher. They have better necrodermis. They're semi-sentient shock troops who kind of have glimmers of consciousness, spark up every once in a while like the thrill of the kill or a warrior's pride type of thing and then lich guard are the bodyguards they're fully sentient for the most part they have eternal loyalty because as command protocols go they cannot be non-loyal anymore which is pretty neat see death marks they're really cool they're sentient hyperspace hunters they're part of the old assassin guilds Gil guilds jeez sorry um, and they can also go into their own little pocket dimension where they can wait for as long as they want to appear and snipe an enemy and then leave again. A lot of lords don't use them, though, because they go against the old codes of honor. So I guess half and half because a lot of lords are not so honorable anymore. The Triarch Praetorians I talked about earlier. They're the executioners and lawbringers who are lots of fun. And probably the most iconic Necron unit is the Monolith. You, you awaken yeah. the Monolith. And you win your Dawn of War game because it's OP. Um, but it takes up. three years because I've hidden 50 bone stickers. Yeah. <laughs> Spicy architecture. Truly, truly. The monolith has a giant particle whip that comes out of this big old crystal on top. And I'm trying to remember how particle, how it works, but it basically like appears in the air. And it's just like this incredibly destructive beam of energy that pow, it kills people real good. Pow. It also has a <laughs> it also has a wormhole in it, which is pretty fun. On the tabletop, it's like surprisingly good in close combat because it just sucks people into the wormhole, which goes back to the tomb world, which is how it can get uh, legions of Necrons can transport be transported through this portal, or enemies can be transported back then to be beat up by all the Necron warriors on the other side waiting for them. And there's Doom sides and Night sides that go they're like almost like light speed they're not light speed but you know they're faster than every other plane ship in the galaxy other than probably eldar stuff and doomsday arcs are probably my favorite vehicle besides the monolith is they're also cool <laughs> um and they have these apocalypse guns rigged up to them that fire battle ending shots so you can like win so that they win battles in single shots they just have to be perfectly placed uh and i think you know we've i think we've talked about enough <laughs> we've talked about destroyers there's lots of different types of destroyers there's ophidians now which are a mix of destroyer and flare uh diseased units which are neat there's not really any lore on them it just says that they exist but yeah i'd say that's that's enough necrons for today that is the Necrons. Ow. Wow, that's not quite extensive, necrons, isn't it? Necrons. Let's go. Cool. 
Any best closing? Faction. Oh, go sorry. Fourth best sorry, faction. They said best faction. Any uh, closing thoughts, fourth. brothers? Fourth not best. well. Not so much a four, but it's it's it's. I mean, I think we can all acknowledge that I'm pretty in Imperium heavy uh, on my channel, so I will be soon delving into Necron lore a bit more. Because again, I don't know all that much apart from the basics. Um, so this was a good primer for me, and I hope for a lot of other viewers today who maybe aren't that familiar with the Necrons, but will now have plenty of avenues to go. Oh, that sounds really interesting, and 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 then work on you know learning about particular characters because it seems like there's only been like the last few years a groundswell of necron lore whereas for a long a time it's just it, been yeah. oh just oh spooky skeletons and now they've got personality and the, you've had books like the infinite and the divine and uh the the silent king books it seems like recently they've been doing a good job of like slowly making them a bit more interesting in terms of characterization any thoughts uh colin as well uh, I mean, a lot of what we said, a repeat of what Andy said, or Jesus Christ, that sentence was something. <laughs> a bit of a repeat of what Andy said, but I know I find them uh, definitely one of the more interesting factions in 40k, both partially some bias creeping over from fantasy and that they're tomb kings in space, but I don't know, they, uh, I like very much that they, not that they don't care about, like, the other races of the galaxy but how completely and utterly like indifferent they are like abaddon you know he can make a big show of whatever his latest plan is and the imperium is going to react with you know terror and hurried uh preparations and then the necrons gonna be like oh well this i guess you know we'll just deal with this i guess yeah we forgot to talk about that the necrons almost closed the eye of terror i think they did uh, yeah. in the d during the fall of cadia they nearly shut the thing down isn't, yeah. isn't there like a um what is it? Necron pylons. Gothic. Yeah. yeah. Like an ending where they just like, if they won, they just oh, yeah. close the rift and they move yeah, on. They do. Like, that's, it, they're like, done. Yeah, it also <laughs> happens like instantly. Like they yeah. turn on yeah, a machine, yeah. five seconds go by, <laughs> and die of terror. Yeah, it's literally like, and finished. That's off the Ooh, list. Oh, wow, I forgot to talk about the Necron Death Star. They're, they mm. made a Death Star called the World Engine that was literally just like exterminating planets, planets left and right. And so the Astro and Ice chapter had to sacrifice themselves to blow it up. Which also briefly, cool. just a brief mention on Necrons also interact with Blackstone, which I think the Eldar do as well. It's mm -hmm. somewhat a polarizing uh, material that can either be used to amplify or nullify psychic powers. A, uh, Necrons possibly made loads of artifacts with it throughout the galaxy, like the pylons, which could supposedly close up access from the warp so there's some yeah. cool shenanigans there um yeah I'll, I'll, I'll also oh, the Trazen just like um essentially helping to basically close activate the pylons on Cadia that were buried <laughs> under the ground and then almost succeeded in helping close the um eye of terror but then uh Abaddon threw up <laughs> threw an entire yeah. ship at the planet Pain. He took uh, a gigantic Beyblade at Cadia. He just did. <laughs> <laughs> um, but know. with the oh, anything, anything else, boys? Don't forget how Trazen released uh, also in Battlefleet Gothic a, a tyrannid swarm of a quite humorous extent onto the phalanx and ruined it. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> a bit, a bit of a prank. Mm -hmm. uh, but with that being said, though, thank you guys so much for listening and watching. Uh, I want to see some big old uh, comments on this one because I think Eli deserves a lot of praise doing so much research on this topic because uh, he cares. Indeed. He cares a lot about um, Necrons and he's he's done a fantastic job, I think. So show some love for Eli here. Um, but with that being said, though, we do, you know, we, we appreciate the love and support and also that you watched. Uh, if you made it this far, thank you so much. And next time we... Actually, will there will be some talk of Necrons next time because they make an appearance in the next subject for the podcast. We'll be doing one on uh, Mephiston, Lord of hey. Death. There'll be some. Ooh. There is a a Necron book. Uh, that, or here, here, one of his books is Necron focused. So it'll be nice to have that. Make a in. cameo. The Necron yeah. has some good things to say about the Elder in it. I know the dialogue. <laughs> I know what he says. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, 
so there'll be we'll be doing you know good old blood angels and perhaps the most op space marine currently alive in the setting <laughs> but, but still cool not like not not cringe in a way he's still uh really fun and uh we hope you all enjoyed and we'll catch you on the next one peace hey, well, that's up, but chaos what a disaster thank you thank you